הכל? Live is up. PC recording has started. Recording has started. Dr. Perez, you may start with the opening. Good morning. Welcome to New York City Council's remote subcommittee hearing on zoning and franchises. Everyone, please turn on your videos at this time. Silence all electronic devices. All written testimony can be submitted to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that is land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you, Chairman. We're ready to begin. Thank you so much. Um, good morning. I'm Councilman uh, Francisco Moya, Chair of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. Uh, I'm joined remotely today by Council Members Ayala, Reynoso, Gridenchek, Borelli, uh, and also we are joined by uh, Council Members Eugene and Yeager. I would like to first note that the Court Theater Zoning Text Amendment and Special Permit Proposal listed on today's agenda under LUs uh, 712 and 713 are being laid over. Today we will be holding public hearings on a number of new applications. Before we begin, I'd like to recognize our subcommittee council to review the remote uh, meeting procedures. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Moya. I am Arthur Ha, counsel to this subcommittee. Members of the public wishing to testify at this subcommittee uh, were asked to register for today's hearing. If you wish to testify and have not already registered, we ask that you please do so now by visiting the uh, New York City Council website at www.council.nyc.gov to sign up. Members of the public may also view a live stream broadcast of this hearing at the Council's website. When called to testify, individuals appearing before the subcommittee will remain muted until recognized by the chair to speak. Applicant teams will be recognized as a group and called first. Members of the public will be called and recognized and panels in groups of up to four names at a time. When the chair recognizes you, your microphone will be unmuted. Please take a moment to check your device and confirm that your mic is uh, unmuted before you begin speaking. There is a slight delay in the unmuting process. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have additional testimony you would like the subcommittee to consider, or if you have written testimony you would like to submit instead of appearing here before the subcommittee, you may email it to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number and or project name in the subject line of your email. During the hearing, council members with questions should use the Zoom raise hand function. The raise hand button should appear at the bottom of your participants panel. Council members with questions will be recognized in the order of raised hands and Chair Moya will then recognize members to speak. Witnesses are reminded to remain in the meeting until excused by the chair as council members may have questions. Finally, there will be pauses over the course of this meeting for various technical reasons and we ask that you please be patient as we work through any issues. Chair Moya will now continue with today's agenda items. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, I now open the public hearing on pre-considered LU items for the 42-0128th Avenue rezoning proposal under ULERP number C190517 ZMQ and number 190518 ZRQ. Relating to property in Council Member Constantinides' district in Queens, the proposal seeks a zoning map amendment to change the R5 to and an R5 C12 district to an R6A and an R6A C12 districts, and a related zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing options one and two. The proposal, the proposed action would facilitate the development of a new eight story mixed use building with 54 <coughs> dwelling units, 16 of which will be affordable, as well as ground floor commercial use. Uh, Council, if you can please call up the uh, first panel for this item. The applicant panel includes Nora Martins, Land Use Council appearing on, the, uh, on behalf of the applicant, Christopher Vlasic on behalf of the restaurant applicant, and Nellie Minella, the project architect. Panelists, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to begin to speak. 
Thank you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having us here, uh, Chair but Moyo. Before you begin, this is Nora uh, Martins. Let me let me just stop you just really quick. I just wanted to make sure, uh, Council, if you could please uh, administer the affirmation. Analysts, please raise your right hands. <clears throat> Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all sub, uh, all council member questions? Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, we have received your slideshow presentation for the proposal. Uh, when you're ready to present it, please say so, and it will be displayed on the screen by our staff. Slides will be advanced when you say next. Uh, please note that there might be a slight delay in both the initial loading and the advancing of slides. As a technical note for the benefit of the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of this presentation, please send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. That's land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now if um, the panelists would please uh, restate your names and affirmation for the record, you may begin. Good morning, Nora Martins from Ackerman LLP, land use council for this project. Uh, good morning, Chair Moya and council members. Thank you for having us here today. Um, if we can get the slide show up on the screen now, that'd be great. Thank you. So I'm joined today by Christopher Vlasic uh, from the applicant and the owner of the family restaurant that's located on the site now, and also by Nellie Hennessy from Caliendo Architects project architect in case there are any questions um, that she can help answer. The application uh, involves the block fronts along 28th Avenue between 41st and 43rd Streets and Community Board 1 in Queens. We'll facilitate the redevelopment of the existing Pickle of Venezia restaurant site, uh, which has been operating in the historic community for nearly 50 years. We'll allow the construction of a new mixed use building uh, with MIH, permanently affordable housing units, as well as bring several other um, existing multifamily residential buildings uh, on the block closer into uh, compliance with these uh, zoning regulations. Um, just briefly before I continue through the presentation, I'm gonna turn it over to Christopher Vlasic to give a little background and history on the, their restaurant and, and the reason for this application. Next, please. Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yes, okay. Um, my name is Christopher Vlachich and my parents, Ezio and Juliana, opened this restaurant you see here, Pico Venezia, at the corner of 28th Avenue and 42nd Street in 1973. And under my family's leadership, what started out as this small neighborhood trattoria soon blossomed into one of the most critically acclaimed restaurants in the city, and as many would say, synonymous with the neighborhood that we grew up in. In normal times, we employ about 30 full-time people, most of whom are local to Astoria and have been with us 20 plus years, even a couple since day one. The vast majority of customers that we serve are longtime regulars. And although they continue to be loyal, the restaurant has failed to attract the newer demographic of Astoria residents, which has replaced our longtime regulars. And having success in the restaurant industry has always been difficult. And we've seen too many empty storefronts appear where restaurants once stood because owners were hesitant to change and adapt to changing market conditions. We feel that the residents of Astoria are vital to our future success and what will ensure viability for the next 50 years. Astoria is much a part of what makes Pico Venetia special as our family, our staff, and our product. As you just heard, our plan is to temporarily relocate the restaurant within the neighborhood while redeveloping our property to bring a mix of new homes, including affordable inclusionary homes, above the newly renovated people of Venezia. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. So um, next slide, please. You can see here, just have an aerial map showing um, a portion of the rezoning area, including the current location of the Piccolo Venezia restaurant. Um, 28th Avenue is wide street, 80 feet wide and occupied by several um, approximately 50 foot tall um, residential buildings with FARs that far exceed the existing 
what's permitted under the existing R5 zoning, which would allow a 1.25 FAR. Most of these are between three and almost four FAR. And further east are actually some even taller buildings. So in addition to facilitating the development of the applicant site, um, this rezoning uh, helps to bring a lot of these other existing buildings really reflects the existing conditions on the ground. Next. And this slide just shows the existing restaurant. Photos of that. Next. Uh, existing conditions um, on the north side of the street. You can see some of those uh, pre-war residential buildings that don't comply with existing R5 zoning. Next. And again, some, just some additional photos showing that those existing conditions that um, on the sites we would be seeking to rezone that are not owned or controlled by the applicant. Next. In order to um, facilitate the proposed development, we're seeking two land use actions, the zoning map amendment from the existing R5 and R5 C12 zoning districts to R6A and R6A C12 zoning districts. Also seeking a zoning text amendment to designate the project area as a mandatory inclusionary housing area. Um, as filed, the application includes options one and two, um, but after consultation with the council member and also with council member Constantinides and also with community board one, uh, we've agreed to modify the application to only propose option one. Next. The slide is a rendering of the proposed development. You can see on the ground floor, the, the new Piccolo Venezia restaurant. Um, and then residential above. The proposed development would have um, almost 40, just under 45,000 square feet of residential floor area with 51 dwelling units, of which 13 approximately would be MIH units, uh, option one. Option one is, uh, just as a reminder, although I know the council is very familiar, is 25% uh, of the floor area at an average of 60% uh, AMI or less. And then the commercial space would be occupied by the restaurant, um, approximately 7,000 square foot upgraded space. Um, the last element of this proposed development is uh, parking. There will be 66 parking spaces. Uh, only 19 are required for the residential development. Um, 47 of the parking spaces are, are permitted, which does exceed the, the minimum required. However, in this neighborhood and based on, you know, uh, the Vlasich families experience running a restaurant here and also the feedback from the community board, the additional parking is, is much needed in this neighborhood and will alleviate any um, parking burden on the surrounding streets. Next. Here's a site plan which just helps illustrate um, how the building is sited on the site and where the parking would be. Some of it will be um, open and some will be at the cellar level. Next. One other interesting element of this project is the sustainable urban rooftop garden, um, which would you know, be a green roof, uh, which is great for environmental purposes and will also be an urban vegetable garden for Piccolo Venezia. Um, so uh, interesting concept that I think is definitely part of bringing the restaurant into uh, the new century. Next. Uh, this slide shows the proposed affordability mix, um, which is the unit distribution of the MIH units um, at the various rent levels to achieve the average of 60% AMI, um, just for illustration. Um, in one of the, in addition to um, changing the MIH option, other changes to this project that have been made through the public review process and based on the input of um, stakeholders and council member Constantinides was to increase the number of uh, larger units, the two and three bedrooms, and also um, to reduce the height of the building, um, which I think resulted in the rendering that you saw earlier, uh, from eight stories to six stories, which is contextual with the surrounding development, and um, we think results in a building that, that works on this corner. That, um, next. Yeah, that concludes our presentation. Of course, 
we're all happy to answer questions. Great, thank you so much. I just got a, a two questions real quick. If you if you do, if you could, um, can you just say what are the relocation plans for the restaurant um, that you're currently operating on site, if if at all? Christopher, do you want to speak to that? Uh, yes, we have been actively looking for spaces, but also trying to time it with. Uh, some reopening to indoor dining. We're currently not operating at all um, as delivery, takeout, and uh, outdoor dining is just not viable for us. Right. Okay. And if you could, uh, please, con if you can confirm uh, the applicants, uh, that the applicant intends to utilize MIH option one for this development? Yes, confirmed. Perfect. Um, that's all the questions for me. Um, I now invite my colleagues to ask questions. If you have any questions for the applicant, uh, please uh, use the raise hand button on the participant panel. Um, council, uh, are there any other council members with questions? Jeremiah, uh, council member Ayala has a hand raised. Hi, good morning. Um, I have two questions. One, will the affordable housing unit residents um, benefit from any of the amenities in the building? And two, why um, did you opt out of developing any three bedrooms? Well, in answer to your first question, yes. I mean, the um, affordable, the MIH unit owners will have access to everything that the market rate tenants will have, including the rooftop, which as you saw, will be a green roof with the uh, urban vegetable garden. So that's a really nice amenity that will be available to everybody. And then um, there are three bedrooms in the, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. There are no three bedrooms. It's a small, it's a very small building, only 51 units. Um, so I think two bedroom was the most that made sense in, in laying out the building. We did increase the number of two bedroom units from 17 in the initial proposal to 23 two bedrooms. Uh, so, you know, almost, almost half of the units are, are two bedrooms. Okay. Uh, Council Morayala, did you have another question or? I'm muted, okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I try to mute myself in the middle so that you can respond. I'm in my apartment. You don't want to hear what's going on here. Um, but no, I, I, I don't have any questions for now. Um, I, I'll, you know, I'll review it a little bit further. And if I have any questions, I can follow up later offline. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Ayala. Uh, I want to recognize that we've been joined by uh, Council uh, Member Rivera. Uh, Council, uh, do we have any uh, other council members that wish to ask any questions? Uh, no, Chair, I don't see any other members with the hand at this time. Okay, um, there being no further questions, the applicant panel is excused. Uh, council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the 4201 28th Avenue rezoning application? There are any members of the public who wish to testify on the 28th Avenue rezoning proposal, please press the raise hand button now. We have council member Ayala coming back for a question real quick. I'm sorry to the applicants. Do we still have them or did they lose them? It appears that the applicants have been removed. It's okay. Does anybody, I, I just wanted to ask about the community board, but I, I can get that information later. I get it to you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, members of the public wishing to testify on the 28th Avenue rezoning proposal are asked at this time to uh, press the raise hand button and the meeting will briefly stand at ease uh, while we check to confirm uh, members of the public.
Chair, I see uh, no members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Okay. Um, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on 4201 28th Avenue rezoning proposal under Euler numbers C190517 ZMQ and N190518 ZRQ, this, uh, the public hearing is now closed and this item is laid over. I now want to open the public hearing on pre-considered LU items for the 16th Avenue rezoning proposal under Eulerps number C200. Uh, 62 ZMK and N200063 ZRK relating to property in Council Member Yeager's district in Brooklyn. The proposal seeks a zoning map amendment to change a, an R5 and an R5C22 district to a C4A district and a related zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing options one and two. The proposed action would facilitate the development of a five-story commercial office building. Um, but before we uh, hear from the applicant, I would like to give my uh, colleague, Councilmember Yeager, the opportunity to make some remarks if he has any. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as, as I typically do, I, I'd like to defer to the chair to run the committee and uh, come back in afterwards if necessary, if there are anything that comes up uh, from the applicant's testimony. Great. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council, uh, can you please call up uh, the first panel for this item? The applicant panel includes Richard Lobel and David Rosenberg, Land Use Council appearing on behalf of the applicant, Jack Goldenberger and uh, Isaac Lefkowitz. Panelists, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to begin to speak. And council, you, Chair, uh, council members, good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Before you begin, uh, just, uh, Council, if you could please administer the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony uh, before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, we are in receipt of your uh, slideshow presentation for this proposal. When you are ready to present the slideshow, uh, please say so, and it will be displayed on the screen by our staff. Slides will be advanced when you say next. Please note that there may be a slight delay in both the initial loading and advancing of the slides. Once again, anyone who uh, requires an accessible version of this presentation uh, may send an email request to testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now, if the panelists would uh, please restate your name and affirmation for the record, you may begin. Richard Lobel of Sheldon Lobel PC for the applicant. Um, to, should the rest of the panel state their names as well? If they could, that'd be great. David Rosenberg of Sheldon Lobel PC for the applicant. Is it just David and, and Richard? I believe we have Isaac Lefkowitz is on as well. Okay. Isaac Lefkowitz, uh, Senior Vice President, Charcoal Pharmaceutical, the applicant. Great, thank you. Uh, and now you may begin. Thank you, Chair. Council members, good morning, Richard Lobel. Can you please start the presentation? So the rezoning here is the 16th Avenue rezoning, as was stated in the introduction, this rezoning would allow for a five story commercial building to be established at the applicant site. The rezoning uh, would allow for the current R5C22 zoning to change to a C44A, which is an R7A residential equivalent. Next slide. This is a little bit of a background with regards to the rezoning. Chartwell is a full service manufacturing packaging and supply chain service organizations with decades of experience in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, currently, the applicants' operations are spread between several locations, including in Conjures, New York and Rockland County. Um, there's also office location 
in lease space along 16th Avenue. So really what this does is it's twofold. It allows for the applicant to consolidate and allow for existing workers, many of whom live in the surrounding Borough Park area to work close to home. And importantly, it allows for employees who are uh, currently commuting roughly two hours to the Rockland County location to work uh, in Borough Park as well. With regards to the employment at the site, the uh, 35 existing employees would be uh, added to, there'd be about 50 additional employees. Um, this applicant has been searching for a site for a number of years, starting in 2015. And at the time of purchase, the development site was occupied by two commercial tenants. Uh, there is no longer a residential tenant here. So this is an available development site. Next slide. So immediately what's to note about this rezoning is that there are some higher density districts in the area of the rezoning. There's R6A immediately to the south. There's R6 to the north. And importantly, there's a C81 district immediately across the street. The C81 district being an intensive commercial district, which is primarily utilized for auto related and other intensive commercial uses. So a C44A here was seen to be a particularly appropriate zoning district. Next slide. You can see here the C44A would be drawn back 100 feet from the site and the R5 district would uh, maintain the remainder of the space within the rezoning beyond the 100 feet. Uh, you can see the applicant site here highlighted in red. It is a relatively small site with existing longstanding and deteriorating three-story buildings. Next slide. So this is the land use map and this kind of shows what the situation is on the ground. You can see that um, there is commercial and community facility use in, immediately in and around the area of this property. Um, you'll notice that there's a, an area shaded in blue to the south of the site. This is the police precinct, obviously a lot of activity at this spot. And with regards to the land use in general, the C44A has an R7A residential equivalent which would allow for a 4.6 FIR residential building. In Brooklyn, in previous rezonings that we brought before the council, this has been a, a, a tested and accepted methodology when you have a, a site which is on a wide street um, or um, you know, in this case, an 80 foot wide street, uh, one which is a, a major thoroughfare in the area, um, city planning and the council have seen appropriate to rezone not only to R7A, but even upwards of R7A at R8A and, and, and above. So uh, we think that the bulk here is appropriate. Uh, the commercial use is, as Council Member Yeager knows, and as we've discussed at the community board and borough president has been an issue and one in which we're working, uh, working with, with regards to the uh, local area. Next slide. So we've included pictures from the existing site uh, and from the surrounding area. You'll notice the police precinct uh, immediately adjacent to the area. And you'll notice on the lower left corner, uh, the existing building. To note, the three-story building right now uh, is, is uh, built out to roughly 10,000 square feet. The applicant's proposal here is only for between 16 to 17,000 square feet. So this is not really a rezoning which is uh, seeking a tremendous gain as far as bulk is concerned. It's a very reasonable building with regards to bulk. Um, you could go to an existing building of four stories in the existing R5, um, and you can, you know, the proposal is for a five-story building. It's a very reasonable building. Again, um, the primary goal here is to allow the applicant to locate his um, commercial operations within this site and also to allow for local residents um, who live in and around the Borough Park area to, to commute to and from this site uh, and to, to make this a lot more of a consolidated operation. Uh, please page through the uh, remaining photos, which again, just provide different angles of the police precinct and the surrounding area. The zoning change map is um, again, um, really critical here. You can see the existing uh, R5 with the C22 overlay. Uh, the R5 C22 would be scaled back so that there would be a C44A within hundred feet of 16th Avenue and an R5, solely an R5 beyond. Uh, next slide. So uh, again, this just really denotes the zoning calculations, what we've discussed already. 
with regards to the proposal and an FAR of close to four for the commercial use at the site. Uh, next slide. And now uh, we come to the plans. And I think the one thing I would note with regards to the plans and um, the, um, if you can page through the plans, they're extensive and they show a typical office building. But I would note that with regards to the site plan and with regards to operations at the site, one of the issues that was primarily raised by the community board was with regards to parking and with regards to congestion generally and what would happen to this site. So the applicant went back to the drawing board and was able to pencil out uh, parking both on the ground floor and in a cellar of the site. This is at an additional cost to the applicant. The applicant is accepting of this because the site is so critical to their operations. It's so important for them to be able to uh, allow for local employment, for, to allow for these workers in this area to, um, to, to be able to work at a site close to home. So again, uh, you can see from the front elevation here, this is the sum of the proposal. Um, and I note that the community board did issue a determination against this application. We have been in communication with them constantly in the last several weeks. And we actually hope to be back before them so that we can discuss with them the revisions to the proposal and hopefully through that and through more discussions, uh, gain a, a vote approving this matter. And um, I've got the entire applicant team here. We'd love to answer any questions. Great, uh, thank you, Richard. Um, before I turn it over to uh, council member um, Yeager, I wanted to um, ask you just a couple of quick questions here. Um, the community, uh, sticking with the community board, uh, dealing specifically with the commercial use, they expressed concerns regarding the impact of uh, traffic and parking um, from this application's proposed commercial use. Uh, how do you respond to those concerns? So, you know, I, I would speak and actually I would also defer to David Rosenberg, my um, a colleague who was actually at the community board meeting uh, when, this, when this discussion took place, I was at a conflicting community board meeting that evening. Um, we think that with regards to traffic and parking, there's really two issues to consider. The first and congestion. The first is that um, the provision of 44 spaces below the building will immediately enable uh, us to take some of the stress off the local street system and to provide parking for um, for people uh, entering and exiting the building. So this is kind of an important thing in that to the extent that 16th Avenue is a widely trafficked thoroughfare and to the extent that local residents were concerned, um, this immediately, uh, and again, happy to do this because of the importance of this location to the business, this immediately takes pressure off that local infrastructure, despite the fact that from a zoning standpoint, the parking wouldn't be required. We're talking about quality of life and we're talking about the ability to operate well going forward. The, the more important thing to consider though, and this was, you know, sometimes meetings don't translate as well into Zoom. And so we weren't in the room and weren't able to really kind of show the local area exactly who was involved in this with, with regards to Chartwell, the fact that they are a local business, that their, their owners and operators live in the Borough Park area. We don't expect that the traffic and parking here is going to be the same as it would be for a site where you were having workers come from disparate areas of the city, this is a very local concern. And so we, would, we wouldn't even expect the parking to be 50% filled at any time. But with this extra capacity, with the fact that we uh, achieved a, a negative declaration from environmental review with regards to traffic and parking, and with the fact that we expect there to be an overage of space available, all of this we think really uh, bleeds into the fact that we're gonna have a, a smooth operating facility uh, and, and hopefully are gonna be able to convince uh, people in the area that that is the case. Okay, um, the construction. So the community board also cited concerns regarding the disruption that would be caused by the construction of this development. Are there any plans for, mitigate, for mitigating these disruptions or engaging with uh, local neighbors to keep them informed of the specific construction plans? And also, uh, how would the applicant team conduct outreach to these neighbors? Uh, I'll start just with kind of some standard discussion and then maybe would, would throw it over to Jack to, for further discussion. Um, with regards to construction going forward, this is a, a longstanding building in disrepair. We're, we're anxious and happy to take the building down. Uh, we will, of course, abide by all Department of Buildings regulations and rules with regards to construction. 
but I think we're able here, given the fact that this is not a very large project, we're on a you know a relatively shallow floor plate. Uh, it's it's not a, a, a complex construction operation. We look forward to be able to be able to accomplish this in a straightforward manner. We're going to do uh, clean construction. We're going to have the opportunity here, and we'll make an effort to to reach out to our surrounding neighbors, make sure that there is uh, ample notice, more than would be required under DOB regulations. So uh, I don't know whether or not the applicant wants to add anything in that regard. Well, the only thing that uh, we wish to add, my name is Isaac Lefkowitz. I'm a senior vice president of Charter Pharmaceutical, the applicant, that we're also in close communication with the 66 prison, where a lot of the traffic congestion is when all off-duty cops come with their private vehicles to go on duty. Uh, we own another uh, parking lot two blocks away and we offer them to park their vehicles at no charge during the 18 months of construction period. So a lot of that will alleviate any congestion. Okay. Um, just a couple more questions before I turn it over uh, that deal with uh, local hire and MWBE, can you describe uh, what your plan, your plans to ensure that MWBE, MWBE and locally based contractors and subcontractors are gonna participate in the development? Well, we are committed to, we're actually already in pre-proposal with a local contractor uh, that we have worked before on another project and it's all local and local subcontractors that uh, we intend to hire, including local architect, local engineers. They're all within the vicinity that have ample experience within the community. And can you describe your plans for local hiring in construction? And how many local hires would typically be involved in a project like this? So probably, you know, it's, it's hard to project, uh, but a 15,000 square foot building would probably encompass both uh, between hard construction hire and soft construction hire close to 100 people. Okay. And can you ensure follow up on the progress report uh, to these commitments? Absolutely. Great. And we'd be happy to work with uh, Isaac and the council in order to ensure that. Great. Uh, that's it for me. Um, I'd like to now take the opportunity to turn it over to Council Member Yeager for some questions. Thank you, Chair. I'll be uh, very brief. And, and as always, uh, I start with uh, thanking the Chair for his diligence and, and his work uh, in this project and, and doing the reviews necessary to get us to this point. And I'm very grateful. Um, my, my questions are going to be limited because I've, I've had the opportunity to uh, be at the community board's public hearings. Uh, I've had extensive conversations with the applicants, with the applicants' attorneys uh, over the last few days. And uh, I'll reiterate in public what I've said in private. I typically do not support rezonings that lack the approval of my community board. And here, this is a double whammy because it lacks the approval of my community board and it lacks the approval of my borough president. And uh, so now we're the third step in the process and I typically don't uh, support uh, rezonings when they come with a double negative. Uh, the applicant has represented to uh, myself and to the community board and now to this uh, subcommittee that uh, it intends to revise its, uh, the plans that it submitted uh, and that it discussed with uh, the community board. And it wants another, <clears throat> excuse me, another opportunity to have a conversation with the community board and possibly obtain its support. If that's the case, I'll, I'll, you know, be happy to uh, reevaluate uh, my support. But as things stand today, based on the same concerns that I heard at the community board hearing, which is the concerns of the neighbors concerning parking, Mr. Chair, as you indicated, uh, construction, as you indicated, um, the the lack of uh, of uh, a smooth flow within what is primarily a residential area, as the borough president indicated, uh, it's not something that I can support right now. But I leave the window, uh, the door, and uh, the back door, and the front door, and the side door, and every window in the building slightly open for the applicant to go back to the community board if it so chooses, uh, have another public hearing, 
doing the same outreach that was done uh, prior here to, to give the community the opportunity to come out, uh, see the revised plans, hear the concerns of the community. And if the members of the community have uh, so changed their minds and if the community board uh, recommends a, a change of its heart, uh, then we can have that discussion at that time. And I just wanted to say that on the record to be perfectly transparent about what's been uh, transpiring uh, with this project for the last several days. And with that, I don't have any questions, Mr. Chair, and I'll yield back to you. Thank you, um, Council Member Yeager. Um, council, are there uh, any uh, council members that wish to ask the panelists any questions? No, Chair, I don't see any members with questions uh, at this time. Uh, there being uh, no further questions, the applicant panel is excused. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the 16th Avenue rezoning application? If there are any members of the public who wish to testify on the 16th Avenue rezoning proposal, please press the raise hand button now uh, and the meeting will briefly stand at ease while we check to confirm uh, for members of the public. Chair Moy, I see no members of the public wish to testify on this item. Okay. Um, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on the 16th Avenue rezoning proposal under ULERP numbers uh, C200062 ZMK and N200063 ZRK, the public hearing is now closed and the item is laid over. I now open the public hearing for LU items uh, 714 and 715 for the 42-11 9th Street Special Permit Proposal relating to property in Council Member Van Bramer's District in Queens. The proposal seeks a zoning text amendment and a zoning special permit pursuing, pursuant to the uh, amended text uh, to include the project area within a new industrial business uh, incentive area and to modify various floor area height and setback and parking and loading regulations. These actions would facilitate the development of a 21 story building, which would include re required industrial uses, commercial space and ground floor retail. The development would also include 67 uh, accessory parking spaces and five loading berths. Uh, we don't have any, uh, Council Member Van Bramer is not here. Um, so with that, I would ask the council to please call uh, the first panel for this item. The applicant panel for this item includes Carlos Escobar, Jeff Nelson, and Emma Manson, uh, who will be making the presentation today, as well as a number of additional team members who will be on hand to answer questions, including Michael Rem, Melanie Myers, Ellen Lehman, Carl Orderman, Rachel Belsky, Adnan Pasha, Tim Roberts, Will Warren O'Brien, Brian Weinberg and Andrew Mitchell. Panelists, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to begin to speak. Okay, um, once everyone's ready, uh, council, if you could please administer uh, the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and in answer to all council member questions? No. Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, when, you're ready, when, when you're ready to present the slide show, but we need to get somebody to mute themselves for a second there. Okay. Uh, thank you. When you're ready to present your slideshow presentation, please say so, and it will be displayed on screen for you by your staff, by our staff. Uh, slides will be advanced for you when you say next. Please note that there may be a slight delay, both the initial loading uh, and the advancing of slides. As a reminder, members of the viewing public seeking a, an accessible version of this presentation may send an email request to land use testimony 
at council.nyc.gov. And now if the panelists would uh, please restate your name and affirmation for the record, you may begin. Uh, thank you, Chair Moy. I'm Jeff Nelson with RxR Realty. Um, I think we can put the presentation up. Ready? So I lead public-private partnerships for our organization. Um, just to introduce the other folks on the team you'll hear from, um, Carlos Escobar from Titan Machine Corp and Emma Manson also from RxR. Um, this project in Long Island City is a partnership between RxR and Titan Machine Corp, which is a long time uh, Long Island City business. So first and foremost, I'd like to turn it over to Carlos to introduce himself and Titan. Next slide, please. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, my name is Carlos Escobar. I'm the president of Titan Machine. Um, it's my favorite slide. You can see the resemblance between me and my father, who uh, started the company back in 1973. And ever since we've been in the neighborhood, so nearly 50 years now. Uh, Titan is a manufacturer of elevator parts, and we also repair and refurbish them. We like to think of ourselves as the company that builds and repairs all the parts of the elevator that you don't see as a passenger. Um, so we've been in the neighborhood for roughly 50 years since 1973, and a lot has changed, of course, uh, particularly with manufacturing. And we know that we need to make some investments in our company in order for us to, to continue to flourish. Um, so we've been lucky enough to find a partnership with RxR, a company that shares our commitment to investing uh, in the neighborhood and not just preserving, but expanding the industrial character of it. Uh, a neighborhood that's been so good to me, my family, and our employees. Um, so we've spent uh, much of the last two years uh, discussing with our neighbors and members of the community um, and getting feedback from them about the project. And you're going to hear a lot about how we've incorporated that into uh, the development. I'm going to let Jeff and Emma, who will be on shortly, to talk more about those details. But ultimately, uh, we believe this project uh, creates a mixed-use industrial office building that preserves and expands the neighborhood's industrial character, creates thousands of temporary and permanent jobs, and also strengthens the local economy, uh, not just during the COVID recovery, but hopefully the sustained growth that follows. It also, of course, allows us to leverage the value of our property, reinvest in our company, um, and, and become the company we, we, we'd like to be uh, going forward. So with that, I'll turn things back over to Jeff and Emma, uh, who could walk you through the rest of the project. Next slide, please. So just to touch on um, RxR for a second, we're a 500 person vertically integrated firm. Um, we've been in the New York area since uh, the mid 20th century, RxR and its predecessors. Um, we have a singular focus on the New York area. We control about 25 million, million square feet of commercial property, and that ranges from midtown office space to outer borough industrial space. Um, we're um, particularly proud of our work in public-private development, um, partnerships and projects that deliver on policy and programmatic goals for our partners, including you know, um, folks like Carlos and Titan. Um, we've been in New York for a long time. We continue to believe in uh, the diversity and opportunity of the New York region. And that's particularly true in Long Island City, um, even in the midst of COVID. Um, we think ultimately that this pandemic will accelerate um, some of the demand we've seen for hybrid workplaces and a more distributed model for companies, um, particularly as folks try to stay off the subways, have walk to work opportunities and so on. And with that, I, I'd like to turn and talk a little bit about the project specifically. So on the next slide, please. Um, the project is located at Queens Plaza South um, between 9th and 10th Street. This is the current M14 zoning district. Um, the site's about a 10 to 15 minute walk from the F at Queens Bridge and multiple trains at Queensboro Plaza. Um, it's also proximate to Queens Bridge houses. And we're gonna talk a little bit, of, little bit about the work we're doing with organizations associated with Queens Bridge and the community there. Um, the current building which is occupied, owned and occupied by Titan, is about one and a half stories and it sits on a 50,000 square foot footprint. Um, the building itself is about 45,000 square feet of industrial space and about 10,000 square feet of um, ancillary office space. Titan has about 20 employees on site today. Next slide. 
So the project, and I'll, we'll show you an image on it on, in a moment, but the proposed project is a new industrial and commercial building. And to enable the projects, we're here requesting um, approval under UORP for the following zoning actions. The first is to implement the Industrial Business Incentive Area Zoning Program. Um, IBIA is a policy initiative to spur development of new industrial and commercial space and provides that for every square foot of industrial space that's constructed, a developer can build a certain amount of office space along with that. Um, that industrial space is an optional, it's required, and any tenants must be industrial users that fall within specific industrial and manufacturing zoning use groups. Um, we're also requesting a special permit to allow the um, six and a half FAR commercial industrial space. This is effectively a request to expand the permitted uses under the existing FAR, FAR at the site. Um, there aren't any zone or um, height or, or um, massing changes requested. Uh, and then finally, we're also requesting some adjustments to load and birth uh, requirements. On the next slide, you can see uh, a rendering of the proposed project. So um, this is a ground up development that's intended to bring both office and industrial space and jobs to the neighborhood. The base of the building to so the third floor has the required industrial space that I just mentioned. This is about 70,000 square feet of space. So that would be a over 50% increase to the existing industrial space on Titan site today. Um, the balance of the floors above the third floor are office space, about 270,000 square feet. In addition, um, some key design elements to touch on were uh, incorporating widened sidewalks, a landscape open space with a public art component and retail at the corner of 10th and Queens Plaza South to try and activate that corridor um, and improve the public realm um, and uh, additional improvements that Emma will speak to later. Um, the resulting project will create about 1,500 jobs, increase the industrial space and leverage community partnership. Um, I wanna turn it over to Emma to dig into some more detail and also talk about those partnerships a bit more. Emma? Great, thanks Jeff, we can go to the next slide. So I'm gonna go into a bit of detail about the project starting from the ground up. We thought it was helpful to have this ground floor plan because it really demonstrates how this zoning and the building is designed to combine two different uses, industrial and commercial, and improve the public realm and integrate into the neighborhood. So what you see at right is the ground floor. The street at the bottom or the green spaces is 10th street. Uh, the top is ninth. What we've done here is separate the industrial and commercial lobbies with the office lobby on 10th and the industrial lobby on 9th. The blue spaces you see here are industrial space and the purple space is a permitted retail space, which we're hoping can be, you know, some food manufacturing, something that's open to the street or the plaza or potentially something that's connected to the industrial space. We also worked in depth with our design team to come up with a smart parking and loading solution for the property. So at the left-hand side, you see the gray portions. This is interior parking and loading. There are 67 parking spots in the ground uh, basement of the building, which are accessed by a ramp on 9th Street. There are also five interior loading docks that provide headed and head out loading, which reduces the amount of time that any truck will spend on 9th Street trying to get into the building. The building also includes 43 bike parking spaces on the ground floor. And as Jeff mentioned, there is landscape public space on 10th Street, as well as landscaping improvements on Queens Plaza. Uh, you know, this building replaces a very traditional old school close to the street one story industrial building with something that has ground floor transparency. You can see into the spaces, there's new lighting, landscaping, and we're really excited about the opportunity to have some public art on the plaza space that we're looking forward to partnering with a local nonprofit or arts organization to select something that really demonstrates the vitality of the neighborhood. On the next slide, we included a stacking plan, which we think really demonstrates the opportunity with this IBIA zoning to combine different uses and create jobs. So as Jeff noted, the bottom three floors are the required industrial podium shown in blue. That's 70,000 square feet of real industrial space. It's designed to different specs than the office. It has heavier floor loads, higher ceilings, and two dedicated freight elevators. The floors above that from four to 21 are office space. So altogether, this is a job generating project. As Jeff said, it creates around 1,500 permanent jobs compared to those on site today. Of those, around 300 to 350 will be industrial jobs. And what 
what's really something we're excited about is that this project brings not just more industrial jobs to the existing Long Island City IBZ, but it also brings around 1,200 office jobs to a business district outside Manhattan. And, you know, around 80 to 85 percent of office jobs today are still concentrated in Manhattan. And we think this is a really exciting opportunity to have those be more accessible to our neighbors in Long Island City. The other thing of note is that this is a project that is squarely in line with the mayor's 100,000 jobs plan and a 10 point to kind of benefit and grow the unique mixed use character of Long Island City, which is identified as a core strategic area in both of those. On the next slide, please. As Carlos mentioned, we've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years speaking with our neighbors and the community members on how this project can be an economic opportunity for the neighborhood. And as long-term uh, members of the neighborhood and partners, RxR and Titan are very focused on making sure that this does create those opportunities. We've already developed strong partnerships to collect res connect residents to the construction jobs created by the project. So as Jeff mentioned, we've been working closely with some Queensbridge-based organizations on two programs we're very excited about that provide transferable skills and you know a direct skills-based access to jobs on our site. The first with Urban Upbound is a recruitment coaching and training program for 100 residents that results in OSHA certifications and training. With LaGuardia Community College and Amir and Jewel and the CUNY system, we're working on a construction skills training program that will result in credentials and a pretty intense training program in electrical and plumbing trades. And then we're all be working with On Point Security, which is a worker co-op based out of Queensbridge to provide job site security. We've also you know, heard from the community and are well aware that many of the most exciting jobs here are the permanent jobs, and those are jobs that are created by our tenants. So we've already started to discuss longer term partnerships with local organizations to think of strategies and ways that we can connect the community to jobs created by our tenants. Some of those, these are slightly earlier because we're closer to construction than to having a building leased up. But with LaGuardia Community College, we've been excited to discuss opportunities based on their existing expertise. And we're also looking forward to having further discussions with additional local organizations like the Settlement House and Sunnyside Community Services. We're also happy to be working with 32BJ on the building maintenance and service jobs. And so on the next slide, we'll just leave with a brief summary and then are happy to take questions. This is a 100% commercial site in Long Island City. It's a new building that provides best in class new industrial and office space to this new diverse dynamic neighborhood in Queens. It has new construction, high quality industrial space that increases what's available today. It's designed for a mix of uses and to really benefit the entire neighborhood, not just the users in this building with improved public space, ground floor retail, public art, lighting and landscaping. We've worked very hard to develop strong community jobs partnerships and have benefited from very helpful input and connections with our neighbors at uh, Urban Upbound, at the Queensbridge Houses, at LaGuardia Community College. And we're excited to be a partnership between a longstanding local business and a development team that are very sensitive to community needs. And with that, we really thank you for your time and having us here today and are open to questions. Thank you. Um, so how, how, how do you plan uh, to respond to the community board's uh, conditional approval that the applicant uh, set aside uh, Ten percent of the industrial floor area within the project uh, at a discounted rate. You know, we've um, you, Jeff. <laughs> there we go. I was waiting for the uh, the allow them to allow me to unmute. Um, thank you. So. Um, so we understand the community board's um, concerns and requests. Um, we were happy that they you know, issued a positive recommendation for this. I think council member, Chair Moya, that um, we're optimistic we'll be able to address their requests and are in conversations with the council member to reach a resolution on that. Okay, and how do you respond to the BP's uh, conditional approval that the applicant uh, hire workers at a uh, prevailing wages? So, uh, so um, as Emma noted, you know, on the permanent side, we'll be working with 32 BJ, and then on the construction side, you know, we um, 
we open our project up to opportunities um, from all firms and contractors, but we're very proud, for instance, of the union participation we've had on uh, other projects um, that we've undertaken in the city. So would this be uh, open shop? It'll be a mix, most likely. There'll be opportunities for firms across the board. On prior projects, we've been able to achieve a fairly robust union participation and would hope to do so here as well. Right, but but that would be an open shop, correct? That's right. It's not a mix, it's, it's an actual open shop. Say again, sorry, so I didn't hear It's that. not a mixture, it's actual, it's an open shop, correct? Yeah, the bidding is open to a variety of firms, so you could consider that an open shop project. I just wanted to make sure that I'm, that you were being clear there. Okay, so it's an open shop. Uh, and just lastly, can you provide any more detail on the workforce development plan uh, that you outlined for this project? Sure. So on the construction jobs front, there are two programs, the kind of centerpiece of the workforce development. One is a recruitment and training program in partnership with Urban Upbound that focuses on doing outreach, intake, interview prep, and some OSHA skills training with 100 residents of the Queensbridge houses. So they'll get their uh, eight hour OSHA card, two hour drug and alcohol training, fall prevention. They'll graduate with those cards and we'll be timing that training so that by the time they have those, which are transferable skills, they're not obligated to work on our job, that they'll be available um, for participation. And we are gonna work with our contractors to make sure that they make opportunities available. The second prong of this program is a 30 residents, also with a priority to Queensbridge with LaGuardia Community College that gives them an opportunity to attend LaGuardia's existing plumbing one and electrical one program classes. So those, and I always mix up the hours, but one is 150 hours and one is 160 hours of hands-on training at LaGuardia in their electrical and plumbing labs. Uh, they'll get all materials, lab time, textbooks, they graduate with NCCER cards in both those trades as well as OSHA cards. And again, the idea here is that this is some of these participants, a real set of skills that will enable them to get, you know, be competitive and not just on our side, but on others in the future. And we were excited to work with both of those groups, obviously, because they are real anchors in the community and have an excellent track record of providing these services. Got it. Um, I'm sorry, this is the last one. Um, what kind of tenants do you have in mind uh, the industrial portion of the site? You know, it's a real mix. Um, and we're drawing here on our experience, both operators of mixed use buildings like the Standard Motor Products on Northern Boulevard and Stara Lehigh in Queens, uh, excuse me, in Chelsea, um, but also on the diversity of manufacturing businesses that are in the city today. So I think, you know, great comps are the types of businesses that are at the Brooklyn Navy Yard or at the Brooklyn Terminal. Uh, but it is, you know, there's, as Jeff mentioned, a specific set of uses that are required by the IBIA zoning. So it is very much light manufacturing things with a production component hands-on. Okay. Um, that's it for me. Um, I now invite any of my colleagues to ask questions. Um, I'm going to ask uh, our council to see if any council members uh, have any questions for this panel. Uh, no, Chair, I see no members with hands raised for questions for this panel. Great. Um, there being no further questions, uh, this panel is now excused. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the 42-11 9th Street special permit application? Yes, Chair Moya, there are approximately uh, 11 public witnesses who have signed up to speak. For members of the public here to testify, please note again that witnesses will generally be called in groups of four. You are a member of the public who has signed up to testify on the 4211 9th Street Special Permit proposal. When you hear your name being called, please stand by and prepare to speak when the chair says that you may begin. Please also note, once all panelists in your group have completed their testimony, you will be removed from the meeting as a group and the next group of speakers will be introduced. Once removed, participants may continue to view the live stream broadcast of this hearing at the council's website. We will now hear from the first panel. The first panel will include Maria Free, Charles Yu, 
Elizabeth Luskin, and Hannah Weinstock. The first speaker will be Maria Free, followed by yes. Charles Yu. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, I just want to uh, give a reminder uh, to members of the public, you will be given two minutes to speak. Uh, please do not begin until the Sergeant at Arms uh, has started the clock. Um, and with that, uh, Maria, whenever you're ready, um, you may begin. Your time starts now. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Maria Free, and I'm the Urban Planning and Policy Analyst for the New York Building Congress. On behalf of the Building Congress, we are proud to support RXR and Titan's mixed-use proposal for 42nd 11 9th Street. At a time of unprecedented economic crisis in our city, this proposal to create thousands of jobs for the residents of Long Island City is critical. The Building Congress has, for 100 years, advocated for investment in infrastructure, pursued job creation, and promoted preservation and growth in the New York City area. Our association is made up of over 550 organizations comprised of more than 250,000 professionals. Through our members, events, and various committees, we seek to address the critical issues of the building industry and promote the economic and social advancement of our city and its constituents. As we strive to recover from one of the most severe disasters in New York's history, this proposal is the right type of investment for Queens to build back even stronger than before. In the short term, it will add hundreds of new good paying construction jobs for local residents and the workforce programs ensure Long Island City residents will benefit from these employment opportunities. Once the building opens, the site will also be a hub for over a thousand permanent jobs. Moreover, this project will preserve manufacturing in the city adding even more industrial area than what currently exists. By building commercial office space, RxR will be able to offer that industrial space at affordable rents. And in turn, industrial companies can employ New Yorkers in high quality jobs that provide a path to the middle class. In closing, this proposal is an opportunity to invest in economic recovery by creating jobs for Long Island City residents and strengthening the economy. The Building Congress strongly supports this project and we encourage you to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. The next speaker will be Charles Yu, followed by Elizabeth Luskin. Your time starts now. Hi, this is Charles and I'll defer my testimony to the next speaker, uh, Elizabeth Luskin. So the next speaker will be Elizabeth Luskin, who will be followed by Hannah Weinstock. Your time starts now. Good morning, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee, and thank you for the opportunity to address you today. I'm Elizabeth Luskin, president of the Long Island City Partnership, the local development corporation for LIC. A longer version has been submitted. This creative and responsible project partnering Titan, a longtime LIC industrial family business with RxR, a creative commercial developer and owner, preserves and expands LIC's vital industrial footprint. This is not an easy thing to achieve given the economics of the market. LIC is one of the most productive areas of the state, providing essential goods and services to the region and providing family supporting jobs locally. As the industrial business service provider for the LIC industrial business zone, we provide one-on-one -on -one assistance. By far the most difficult issue facing industrial companies is finding available and appropriate real estate. A consequence of the evolution of LIC into one of the most dynamic mixed use areas of the country has been the reduction of space available for industrial uses. We are also seeing an increase in highly creative but non-industrial companies seeking office space. New, product, new projects rarely add industrial space since the economics rarely work out. That in turn puts added pressure on the industrial rental market. This project actually expands industrial space by 55%. We're also a strong advocate for commercial office space in LIC. It creates a wide range of good jobs, but it's overwhelmingly concentrated in Manhattan. This project will allow Queens residents to better access good paying office jobs. The office component also makes the industrial expansion feasible. Unlike most new industrial space, this project won't receive public subsidies and instead relies on the office rents to provide space that is affordable to local manufacturers. If this project does not move forward, it will be a real missed opportunity to preserve the local manufacturing closer and to grow the existing 21 jobs at the building to as many as 350 new industrial jobs and over a thousand office jobs. This project is a real life demonstration that the expansion of industrial space and creation of office space can together produce a market viable project in Long Island City. 
As we look to recovery post-COVID, we need to encourage investments in our local economy. I'm glad to see two long longtime supporters of the LACP working together on this project. This will be a Time great example up. of what is possible. The last speaker on this panel will be Hannah Weinstock. Your time starts now. Hannah, you may begin whenever you're ready. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Excellent. Uh, I'm Hannah Weinstock, Senior Director of Workforce Development at LaGuardia Community College. And I'm here to speak a little bit more about the workforce development program that we've been working on with RxR in conjunction with this project. Um, as you know, New York City has been hit very hard by the pandemic um, and with communities of color, immigrant communities, Queens communities hit hardest um, by both the public health and economic crises. We have unemployment at an all time high. And so here at LaGuardia, we are laser focused on helping people get back to work and train for uh, jobs in areas that are going to be in demand in the future. Our electrical and plumbing programs represent just that. Um, we're very excited to potentially work with RxR um, to train local residents, uh, NYCHA residents, um, women, uh, people of color, for careers in construction and for work specifically on this project. Um, our trainings are accredited by the National Center for Education and Research, NICER. So the students walk away not only with their OSHA 30 and site safety, but um, indus national industry recognized credentials in electrical one uh, or plumbing one. Uh, they're doing hands-on training as well as theory. They're building circuit boards, drainage systems, et cetera. Uh, we've run these programs for about four years now, and we have seen graduates, um, you know, having a lot of success beginning their careers as electrical or plumbing helpers, apprentices, assistants, et cetera, and then moving up within a few years to junior mechanic uh, positions. So, um, you know, we're, we're excited to make sure that there's access to these jobs and to, you know, for local residents, NYCHA residents, and to be helpful as, as best we can in that. And we welcome any feedback or questions from the uh, community board or the local elected officials. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, council, do we have any council members who have any questions for this panel? No, Chair, I see no members with uh, hands raised for this panel. Okay. Uh, there being no questions for this panel, the uh, witness panel is now excused. Council, can you please call up the next panel? The next panel includes April Simpson, Ben Kubani, Brendan Levy, and Laura Calacursio. First speaker will be April Simpson, followed by Ben Kubani. Your time starts now. Good morning, my name is April Simpson. Can you hear me? We can hear you, April. Yes, April Simpson. I'm former president of the Queensbridge Houses Resident Association. And on behalf of the residents of Queensbridge Houses and the existing three other housing developments in the area, uh, we work very closely with um, Titan, a uh, long time uh, company in our community um, I'm a longtime resident of Queensbridge Houses. I just celebrated a birthday, almost 60 years. I'm not going to change my age, but happy birthday. We, <laughs> thank you. We are so, you know, we were all devastated by COVID 19. And before COVID 19, Queensbridge Houses and NYCHA residents were already devastated economically. And we need this opportunity. It's not just about jobs, it's also about training. And as for the residents, we are, are all in favor of this great opportunity. That's all I wanna say, thank you. Thank you, April. The next speaker will be Ben Kubani, followed by Brendan Levy. Your time starts now. Good morning. My name is Ben Kubani. I'll be reading testimony prepared by Jonathan Bowles, Executive Director of the Center for an Urban Future, a think tank focused on creating a more inclusive economy in New York City. 
I'm testifying in favor of this project because New York City was facing a good jobs crisis long before the coronavirus pandemic, and I believe this project will pave the way for a lot of new good jobs, both in the manufacturing sector, which is still one of the most important sources of middle income jobs for New Yorkers without a college degree, and also in the office sector, which now accounts for the overwhelming majority of well paying jobs that are growing in the city's economy. Supporting manufacturing jobs today requires embracing innovative financing mechanisms like this one. In the last couple of decades, there have been only a few new industrial buildings developed in the city. But as much as I love the manufacturing component of this development, I think the new offices will ultimately create even more opportunities for living wage jobs for lower income residents. Right before the pandemic, 83% of office jobs in the city were in Manhattan. Growing more of these jobs in Queens and other, in the other four boroughs would lead to more jobs and internships for local residents and more training partnerships with local educational institutions. Some people don't think the office sector will help New Yorkers from lower income communities, but I don't think we have a choice. Where good paying jobs have been growing in the city, it's almost entirely been in the office sectors. That was certainly the case in, this, in the years before the pandemic and it's absolutely the case now. Thank you. I yield my time. The next speaker will be Brendan Levy followed by Laura Colacursio. Your time starts now. Good morning, this is Brendan Levy. I'm here on behalf of the Queens Chamber of Commerce and uh, reading this on behalf of Tom Gretsch, our president and CEO. Uh, this is a time that we need to invest in Queens in order to uh, spur economic recovery, uh, preserve and expand the industrial space and create office jobs in Queens. So the Queens Chamber is happy to lend its support to RxR and Titan's proposal. Uh, we believe it's exactly the type of investment Queens needs to come back stronger than ever before. The Queens community has been dis disproportionately impacted by the pandemic and our businesses are struggling. So we need to get behind impactful projects that support job growth, enliven and activate these neighborhoods. Uh, this project will create over a thousand good paying office jobs and uh, they're accessible to Queens residents, which is a bonus. Uh, it also will provide a new home for Queens companies that are looking to grow and expand into modern space without having to leave the borough. Uh, it also includes 50% more industrial space than exists on the site today, which bucks the decades old trend to uh, you know the Queens rental market. Uh, there's a reason uh, that almost nobody builds new ground up industrial space. It's expensive and fetches lower rents uh, than building or than building an office or an apartment complex. Uh, so we're behind this project 110%. Uh, we commend ArcSAR and Titan for exploring this new model uh, for industrial preservation. And I hope it encourages more developers to follow suit. Uh, we're glad to see the project includes underground truck loading and parking, which can help address uh, some of the congestion issues that might've been a concern to the community. Uh, alongside with the new public open space, ground floor retail and other street, streetscape improvements will be a welcome addition to the neighborhood. And uh, all told, this will transform an outdated building with 21 employees into a new facility that creates 300 industrial jobs and over a thousand permanent office jobs. Time expired. Thank you. The last speaker on this panel will be Laura Colacursio. Your time starts now. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Association for a Better New York. My name is Laura Colacurcio, and I'm the Vice President of ABNY, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the healthy growth and renewal of New York City's people, businesses, and communities. As ABNY focuses on the city's inclusive and equitable recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, we are eager to support projects such as this one that create opportunities for New Yorkers to access good jobs with livable wages that allow for career development and economic mobility and wealth. This is more important than ever given the disproportionate impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on historically low income and disenfranchised communities. These communities in all of New York City must continue to receive investment to ensure that the city will ultimately recover from the financial crisis. As proposed, RxR and Titan's mixed use project in Long Island City will create more than 1000 permanent jobs in Queens. The project will also create hundreds of construction jobs and the developers have demonstrated their commitment to ensuring that Long Island City residents benefit from these opportunities through workforce development programs with local organizations like Urban Upbound that will provide certificate training to 100 
200 local residents, 30 of which will receive more intensive training at LaGuardia Community College. This can make all the difference for members of the Queens community who have been impacted by the pandemic and are looking for work and training that allow them to develop a career. ABNY CEO Melvin Miller has personal experience seeing countless projects chip away at the industrial cores of Queens rather than strengthen them. It is rare to see a project that not only preserves but expands the space available for manufacturing and other industrial uses in this community. Additionally, unlike other projects, this is a unique development that does not involve government subsidized rent, but instead employs a new and innovative model to preserve industrial space by using the office space rents to keep the rent of the industrial space affordable. This project provides a means to protect Long Island City's maker's character, create more than 1,000 good jobs, and represents a much needed investment. For these reasons, Abney supports RxR and Titan's proposal. Thank you. Thank you, um, Council. Are there any Council members that have any questions uh, for this panel? Chair, sure, I see no members with questions for this panel. Uh, there being no questions for this panel, this panel is uh, now excused. And Council, if you could please call up the next panel. The next panel includes Mitchell Taylor and Seth Bornstein. First speaker will be Mitchell Taylor. Your time starts now. Good morning, Chair Moya and Land Use Committee. I hope everyone is doing well on this early wintry afternoon. The snow is coming. My name is Bishop Mitchell G. Taylor. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Urban Upbound, a nonprofit that began right in the heart of Queensbridge Houses and now has expanded to a citywide footprint. Uh, Urban Upbound has been working with RxR Titan since 2018. When they first uh, reached out to us to discuss workforce development and a partnership to change inner city communities, not from the outside in, but from the inside out, it was a welcoming conversation. Since then, the scope of our partnership has grown and RxR has continued to support Urban Upbound's mission and work in the Long Island City community. Through Urban Upbound's workforce development program, we will, as others have already identified, uh, we'll work with approximately 100 local residents, prioritizing Queensbridge residents who will receive uh, OSHA training, uh, fall pre prevention training, drug alcohol awareness, other soft skills to support uh, the praxis of work that will be uh, upcoming in the future. Furthermore, we will also identify a subset of participants who will receive further training in the skilled trades from LaGuardia Community College. We are so excited to work with Hannah and her team uh, to put together an innovative, innovative workforce initiative that will be second to none. RxR is working with its contractors to support our efforts in pushing local subcontracting and local minority subcontracting and local hiring. In addition to the workforce development program, Urban Upbound supports the incubation and growth of these local businesses and worker cooperatives. One of the worker cooperatives that we have launched was On Point Security, a Queensbridge-based worker cooperative. Uh, this company will be included Talk in- far. You can You can finish, Bishop. Oh, I'm sorry. This local community uh, cooperative will be providing local security uh, to the project during its development. We're excited to see the potential partnership and investment in job creation here in Long Island City. Rather than building more apartments, this project will create thousands of new industrial and office jobs right here in Long Island City. So we applaud RxR and Titan, and we look forward to a long standing, sustained relationship of community development. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Always good to see you, my friend. Likewise. I'll let Pastor Young know uh, I saw you today. I will. Thank you so much, right. Councilman. All you right. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. The next speaker on this panel will be Seth Bornstein. Seth Bornstein, who will be followed on this panel by Timothy Duval. Your time starts now. 
Hey, good morning. This is Seth Bornstein. I'm a director of Queens Economic Development Corporation. Our mission is to help um, the community through creating and retaining jobs, especially the focus on low and middle income communities, immigrants, minorities, and women. Uh, we support this uh, project by RxR and Taishan um, because it really fits into everything we want to do. It creates a mixed use community, industrial and commercial, which is rare in this city these days, and also supports people who work there from the community, working with LaGuardia, working with Queensbridge, working with Urban Up Bad, it's just everything a community project should be. So we really believe those jobs help the community and money will stay within the communities. Um, it's also important that the project is really fits in the context of the urban environment. And what they've done there on the community, on the uh, streets there is really a, a model for what can be done for other industrial development in the community. Um, I don't want to reiterate so much what, what other colleagues in the panel have said, but uh, it's a great project and a great model for other parts of Queens and the whole city. Thank you for your time. We look forward to this project coming to fruition. The next and last speaker on this panel will be Timothy Duvall. Time starts now. Um, can you hear me? My name is Tim Duvall. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Good. Um, I've been a neighbor of Titan Manufacturing on 9th Street in Long Island City for 39 years. And we are good neighbors. They're a good resident company in this area. They help keep the area tidy and clean. They've cooperated us with um, issues like parking. And we're so pleased that the new building plans incorporate additional parking, which is the most critical thing in this part of Long Island City. Our building is a similar building to Titan Manufacturing in that it has a large footprint, but we intend to keep our building and keep it as it is because we think it has some historical importance and it is the foundry. And it's, it, it uh, holds, caters for events and for weddings, and we see no objection whatsoever for Titan Manufacturing coming to the neighborhood and expanding their business. We also like the idea that it keeps the industrial tone of the neighborhood, and we are totally for and support their application. Thank you. Thank you. Council, do we have any council members that have any questions for the panelists? Chair, I see no members with no members with uh, hands raised for this panel. Okay. Uh, there being no uh, no members of the public um, who wish to testify on 4211 Ninth Street special permit proposal under LU's uh, for. Uh, on, under LU 714 and 715, uh, the public hearing is now closed and this item is laid over. Uh, thank you to the panelists for uh, your testimony today. Um, I now want to open the public hearing for the pre considered LU items for the 1620. Um, uh, Cortel U Road rezoning proposal under ULERPS number C180496 ZMK and N180494 ZRK uh, affecting property in Councilmember Eugene's district in Brooklyn. The proposal seeks a zoning map amendment uh, changing an R6A C24 district to a R7D C24 district and a related zoning text amendment establishing a mandatory inclusionary housing. Uh, area utilizing options one and two. These actions are intended to facilitate the development of a new nine story mixed use building uh, with 85 dwelling units, in, including approximately 21 affordable units, ground floor commercial use, and accessory parking at the seller level. Um, 
I know that we have council member uh, Eugene on hand, and I just wanted to turn it over to the council member if he has any um, remarks uh, before we hear from the applicant. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you so very much. Uh, what I would like to say, I know that uh, this is a very important uh, issue for the community, and there have been a different side, different opinions. And I know that the community wants to see deeper affordable housing also to conserve the market, the laundromat, and other uh, services that exist in that building. And one, one of the things that I would like to, uh, to express is uh, to see the commitment of the developer to hire locally and to make sure that the people in the community who have the skill the competence, they can have also the opportunity for jobs. The other thing also I would like the developer to mention is commitment to buy certain uh, construction supplies in the community also to the uh, construction company companies and uh, to create job opportunities and also to give the opportunity of business to the people and the community. I do believe that uh, the community won't be able to provide everything that they need for this construction, but this is one of the things that I want to, the developer to consider, and this is very, very important for the community. But uh, at this time, I don't have any special position, but I do want to hear, to listen what the developer is going to say. And I know that uh, there's a report from the board president, and there is also a report from the community board 14. After you know, looking over all those reports and the different uh, comments uh, from the community, I will be able to take uh, to have a, a better idea and to know exactly which way I'm going. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Eugene. Um, Council, can you please call up the first panel for this item? The applicant panel for this item includes Richard Lobel and Amanda Iannotti, uh, Land Use Council, appearing on behalf of the applicant, Tony Dole for the applicant, and Victor Folletti, uh, the project architect. Panelists, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to begin to speak. Thank you. Uh, before you begin, Council, can you please administer uh, the affirmation? Panelists, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth uh, in your testimony before this subcommittee and in answer to all council member questions? I do. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We are in receipt of your uh, slideshow presentation for this proposal. When you are ready to present the slideshow, please say so, and it will be displayed on the screen by our staff. Slides will be advanced when you say next. Uh, please note that there may be a slight delay in both the initial loading and advancing of slides. Members of the viewing public can obtain an accessible version of this presentation by emailing requests to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now if the panelists would please uh, restate your name and affirmation for the record, you may begin. Thank you, Chair Moya. Richard Lobel of Sheldon Lobel PC for the applicant. Um, joined by Amanda Iannotti from my office and representing Tony Dole, who is the owner and operator of the food market at the base of the uh, proposed development. I think if these slides could begin right now, that would be great. I want to just start by thanking the uh, council members as well, and especially council member Eugene, who has been very thoughtful in his consideration of this matter, has sat down with us and really caused us to to think about this proposal. What you see before you is a proposed rezoning for 1620 Cortelia Road. Um, Cortelia Market, which is operated currently at 1620 Cortelia, is operated by Tony Dola. And while we come before the council many times with applications from career developers, individuals who um, by right purchase a site and then proceed to do development, this is not Tony. Tony is a local operator of a food store who has been at the site and has operated a food store for over 25 years. Um, this puts him in a unique position with regards to the community. While there were opportunities for him to sell the property and to move on, 
Tony wanted to do a development here which would accomplish seven, several goals. The first would be to keep the food market. And we're gonna discuss with you our opportunity to do so. Uh, the second would be to provide for additional residential units in the community, but also to provide for additional affordable units in the community. And importantly, in community board 14, where these affordable units are few and far between. So with that, we begin the presentation, talk about the background of the zoning, and then the applicant team is happy to answer any questions. Next slide. <coughs> you can see from the next slide is a copy of the zoning map. And to note with regards to the zoning map, and uh, my screen hasn't advanced yet, but I have the presentation and hard copy before me. Chair Moya, can you see a zoning map right now or no? Yep. You can. I got it. Okay. For some reason it is not advanced on my screen, but I'm just going to proceed. Okay. Um, the zoning map currently- and I've got a hard copy here, so you can go. Okay, Yeah. thank you. So page two of the presentation has a copy of the zoning map, which is uh, notably the existing zoning is R6A with a commercial overlay. Um, the R6A, as well as much of the surrounding area was rezoned in the 2009 um, uh, rezoning that was sponsored by the city, which rezoned roughly 180 blocks in the surrounding area. Um, what this did was it, it fixed zoning at R7A with inclusionary housing, voluntary inclusionary housing, for many of the blocks you see south and east of the site. What it did not do was create any inclusionary housing. The, the City Planning Commission in their recent, in their recent report approving this report stated that no affordable housing was created pursuant to zoning in the voluntary inclusionary housing areas. So provision of inclusionary housing here is a, is a worthwhile goal and one which is not really um, populated by current buildings and current development sites. So the proposal would take this existing R6A and would uh, would rezone that to an R70. Next slide. So the next slide has the tax map, which shows the, the, uh, the, the lots included within the rezoning. These are um, four lots along Portelu and then two lots, which would be rezoned to a minimal amount behind those. Um, the R70 C24 would accomplish several things. Uh, in addition to the additional residential bulk, which would um, be at an FAR of roughly 5.6, there would be a commercial overlay of a C24. Now, importantly, in, a, in an R70 zoning district, the C24 commercial overlay mandates non-residential uses. So while an R7A C24 would allow for rezoning of potentially a mixed use building, the R70 mandates that mixed use by requiring commercial or non-residential ground floor uses this is very important because as we will likely discuss with regards to the community board, uh, the community board and borough president noted the importance of the food market at the site. Next slide. So the next slide is a copy of the land use map and you can note several things from the la this land use map as you would expect. Cortelu being an 80 foot wide road is a major thoroughfare in the area. Uh, there are numerous commercial uses which are uh, abounding within the commercial designated area along Cortelu and the commercial overlay. Um, you will note that there is a subway station within a block of the site. This is very important because as city planning will tell you, um, there is a, an importance with regards to the accessibility of sites to local transportation. So in areas in Brooklyn previously where we've brought, rezone, brought rezoning applica applications on wide streets near public transportation with commercial activity, these are areas which are considered to be um, you know, highly desirable for rezonings, uh, allowing access to the site, allowing for a lively streetscape, and that's what would happen here. You'll also notice that to the south and east right, there are six to eight story buildings that abound. These were codified by the uh, most recent um, 2009 rezoning and, uh, you know, our longstanding buildings. Next slide. So the next slide has a copy of the zoning change map. And the zoning change map takes what, what you see as an existing R6A C24 and would change that to an R70 C24. You'll note that if you look at the zoning change map, there's already a portion of the existing site, which is within the R7A. That part is already zoned R7A. That part um, you know, is, is permitted to greater density, albeit it is a small amount. But basically at, the, at this frontage here, uh, there's limited options as far as what you'd be able to rezone to in order to have a productive building, in order to 
actually have an, a development that would move forward. Here, the R7D was chosen to be appropriate given the history of rezonings in the area and Brooklyn and the fact that you do want to, at the end of the day, have a development site uh, as opposed to a site which would, uh, which would you know, remain undeveloped and would have insufficient, uh, insufficient um, backbone in order to uh, establish a building here. Next slide. So the next slide and the slides that follow it are the building plans. And you know, I'd note several things in this regard because we have had conversations, many conversations with the community board, with the Brooklyn Borough President's Office and now with city planning, all of whom in some form and with some conditions have approved this rezoning. Uh, importantly, with regards to the proposal going forward, there was a discussion with regards to the massing of the building. There was a rather large um, dormer on the on the on this corner of the building on 16th and Cortelio. This was removed from the property, and so what you see is is basically a pared down building. Uh, the building would maintain 44 parking spaces beneath the building. This is greater than what is required by zoning by roughly 50 percent. So zoning would require roughly 30 spaces, and uh, the, the rezoning would produce roughly 44 spaces below the building. Um, I would note, because I'm sure that there's a lot of comments and questions with regards to the application and with regards to the community board and council uh, and, and, uh, and borough president recommendations, that many of these comments were geared towards the operations of the premises, how the premises would look, uh, maintaining a, an attractive street, streetscape and such. To, to just talk briefly and not to talk for Tony because he's here and available for questions, but Tony has operated this property for over 20 years. In those 20 years, if you look at DOB violations on the site, while in the last 20 years there are boiler violations, relatively routine boiler violations for reporting, there is not one DOB violation that has been issued to the site in the last 20 years, which is an amazing statistic for a commercial building operating with over 13,000 square feet of commercial operations. The second thing I'd note is in the pictures that accompany this presentation and others, you can see that this is a well-run site. This is a clean site. The pictures that we inserted are random Google photos taken from the last several years. They show a clean streets before the building. It's a well-operated commercial thoroughfare. Uh, we're really excited about the opportunities that Tony has to take a building which is currently one story and over 90 years old and to put something productive up that will help the community will allow for this food store to continue and will provide benefits in the form of affordable housing. We would note here that the, there was a, a lot of concern over operations of the food store going forward. We've submitted plans and materials which demonstrate that we intend to phase the construction to allow for the continued operation of the food store. This is no small thing. We also had many comments with regards to employment. Tony employs over 30 people at the site, many of them from the surrounding area. Uh, and so this is a local job generator. It is heartwarming to hear testimony from individuals who came to the community board hearing and talked about the fact that this food store was the only place they had to go in the immediate area to provide for affordable food. There are other food stores in the area that are not affordable. This is something which is basically heavily utilized by the local area uh, and, and allows for all different types of people uh, to shop in this and and to and to to come here. So, provision of the food store here, the ability to update this building, the ability to generate affordable units in a community district where over half of the households are rent burdened, where the rent burden is greater than the percentages in the city of New York and in Brooklyn. This community board 14, over 50% of homes spend more than 35% of their uh, income on rent. So just the ability to add units when you don't have that opportunity, when previous rezonings, including the 2009 rezoning, failed to produce those results. This is a major opportunity, not only for our applicant here, but for the surrounding area. That's why we feel that we've gotten the support that we have. And that's why we feel that we are strongly uh, urging the council to move forward on this. And of course, we're all happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, um, Richard, for the presentation. Um, just a couple of questions before I, I turn it over to uh, Council Member Eugene. Um, so in order to minimize the, the uh, and mitigate disruption, do you plan to conduct outreach and engagement with the neighborhood during construction? And if so, what are the strategies for that outreach? Can 
Can we unmute Richard? Hold on, Richard. Now I can unmute. Okay. There you go. Um, thank you. Uh, Chair, um, yeah, and, and Tony's available to speak as well, but I would start uh, by saying that I think there's two areas where um, we're particularly uh, well suited with regards to outreach. The first is that Tony already has a tremendous amount of interaction with the local area, given his activities uh, operating the food store here. So there's always communication, there's always dialogue. And that's, I think, one of the reasons that we received the support that we did at the community board. The vote of the community board was 24 in favor, five against. And again, while there are conditions to that resolution, we think that the fundament, fundamental support received is a testament to the fact that Tony is available and can talk to people in the area. So we would, we would view the personal interaction and the ability to disseminate in, in information locally to be a strength of Tony. Uh, and the other thing I'd say is that with regards to outreach, we've already spoken to local organizations. Uh, on the record of the community board, we discussed the fact that we'd reached out to Canva and had preliminary conversations with them about outreach to people in the area, including in terms of financial literacy for those who might want to avail themselves of the lottery system and to have affordable units within the building. So again, I would defer to Tony on that, but I think that you know that, that would be our goals going forward with regards to community outreach. Tony? Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, in regard to outreach, absolutely, I'm open as we always have been. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Tony. Thank you. Uh, uh, we, all, we are always open. We always have discussion with our customers. A lot of our customers are supportive of this project. Uh, I mean, they know how we operated there for the past 27 years now. And we always kept an affordable supermarket uh, with all the changes that's coming from uh, uh, from competition from Amazon and competition from online and all the different things that, that change. But we always kept a supermarket there that's affordable for, for everyone. And this is what we're trying to do here is to achieve this by having uh, uh, basically uh, the building in top and the, the apartments in top to subsidize the affordable supermarket in, in, in the bottom. I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, uh, the, the way things are going, I mean, uh, supermarket owners, if they don't get creative, it's going to be a, you know, very hard in the future to, to, to survive. And, uh, and part of what we're doing here is to be able to survive and to stay there in the community for many years to come. So, uh, uh, you know, our investment in the community there uh, is, is truly to keep mainly the supermarket. We are basically grocers and supermarket, you know, operators. We're not big time developers. But you know, we thought this is, would be better than just selling the property to some developers who, believe me, I get two or three calls every day that they want to you know, buy the property and, and, and redo this, uh, this site. Uh, I don't know if they're going to keep the supermarket or, or it's going to be a very exuberant amount of rent that the supermarket will not be affordable anymore. So uh, us as, as the building owners and as the supermarket owners, we are able to keep providing affordable prices at the supermarket. Uh, I mean, uh, this is what we're trying to do here. Uh, I know there's some neighbors who would like to see this stay as one story building forever, but this is a 90 year old building that's ve becoming very hard to maintain also. You know, so it's a construction and rebuilding need to be done at some point. We will not do, construction will not start right away. It will start definitely after the pandemic and its effect are way over, you know, and because, you know, at this point we understand uh, you know the supermarket need to be at its current condition and operating. So we will we will definitely wait until the pandemic and and its effect uh, on 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 the whole world basically is over. So uh, I'm open yeah. for any other questions. That you... So Tony, just a reminder: how 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 many years have you been there? How, how long has the supermarket uh, since, been there? Since 1995, us and the supermarket been there. You know, previous years, but we and since 1995 we have done. Uh, two times uh, updated the supermarket, uh, and we would like to have a bigger even supermarket than we currently have. So the the, the project will provide a bigger, more mo moderate supermarket with affordable prices. Continue affordable as that's a promise from me and my family who co-owns the, the the business with me, and we want to have affordable housing on top 
also because also that's very much needed in the in, in the neighborhood and this is after discussion with many people in the neighborhood you know there's not much affordable housing and we're doing this without city subsidy or any of that you know and so uh i, I hear you tony thank you um just a couple more questions uh and then i'm going to turn it over to councilmember eugene uh MW, mwbes and local hires uh can you describe what your plans are uh, to ensure that mwbe and local base contractors uh, and their subcontractors are going to be participating in uh, this uh, development. I'll start. It looks like Tony may be muted. Um, so I, uh, I think the answer is that, you know, a couple of things. Tony is going to avail himself likely of tax abatement benefits, uh, which would mandate the use of um, MBWE hiring for, with regards to the construction itself. Obviously not a tremendous job, but um, from what we've discussed internally, and again, Tony can address this, I understand that, that he is committed to using MBWE uh, and local hiring with regards to um, the construction project going forward. Um, I'd also note that importantly, um, you know, there's lots of numbers that get thrown around with regards to actual employees at the site. One of the benefits that we feel of the application itself is that the 30, 30 some odd employees that are currently employed at the food store will likely increase the square footage of the food store would go up, this would now uh, most likely be between 9,000 and 10,000 square feet. And so the opportunity for local hiring for permanent jobs beyond the construction uh, is still very much present with regards to both the supermarket as well as for uh, additional several thousand square feet of commercial space uh, to be used for other retail. So again, um, you know, we understand and as is typically presented by the um, Brooklyn Borough President and others, um, that that we you know we would make a commitment to MBWE hiring going forward. Okay, and just staying on that, you 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 mentioned local hires. Uh, describe the plan uh, for local hiring in construction, uh, and how uh, many local hires would typically be involved in a project like this. Yeah, I think that what we would ask uh, Chair Moya is that we submit this to the to the uh, council to the committee in writing, um, simply because. When Tony and I have discussed this, um, he's recently engaged with uh, professionals with regards to project management moving forward. And so we've had those conversations, but uh, I think we'd be better prepared to submit those in writing. But you don't have a... a... Unless, Tony, unless Tony wants to answer at this point, he may be able to have some better answers. Can we unmute Tony? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely, I was saying that before, but I was mute. Uh, I was, we are definitely open for local hiring and, and, and to give opportunity to local companies and local suppliers to, to submit their bids. And we are very much open, absolutely. I mean, we, we part of the neighborhood and we would like to give opportunity to everyone to benefit from this. Right, no, I, I understand. I'm just saying, what are the actual plans that you have to do that? And on a project like this, typically you will roughly have an idea of how many local hires that would look like. So I'm just asking very basic. But as far as the construction, the construction concern? Yeah. Uh, as Richard said, we will definitely, because I don't want to say numbers just off the top of my head. Uh, I, I would like, I will definitely submit uh, a plan uh, to the council uh, shortly. And right yeah, on. I'm just saying like, there's, there's been plenty of, of time for you to have a plan in action for a project this size. So that's why I'm saying you have no idea. You guys don't have a, a, a ballpark of what that would look like. Uh, as far as the amount of, of jobs uh, that, that, that yeah. you create, you see? Yes? Yes. I'm, I'm sure it's over, over 60 jobs will be created in the construction, uh, you know, Okay. I don't want to take up too much time because I know Councilmember Eugene wants to ask questions, but uh, yeah, we'll we'll follow up when you submit that in writing. Um, and just the last question: we'll, uh, What sustainability and resiliency measures are incorporated into the building's design and construction? We will have solar. Uh, uh, yeah, I think actually, Chair Moya, um, Victor Folletti, the project architect, is on. If we can unmute him, he can address some of the sustainability measures. Yes, thank you. Um, 
So yes, we are planning uh, solar for the roof. Um, we have uh, tried to go beyond the uh, building code requirements for uh, being solar ready and um, are uh, looking into actually putting in the solar panels for the roof. Um, all of the uh, appliances and all of the equipment in the building will be used uh, at the highest efficiency uh, units that we can propose. Um, and uh, all of the uh, required insulation values for the exterior walls and for uh, thermal uh, heat gain coefficients, um, it will all be far beyond the um, requirements for the building code. Um, and, and just to get back a little bit with uh, the hiring and the construction uh, of the project, um, you know, we are, we are dealing with a, a, an owner here, an owner operator of the facility. Uh, he is not a developer. Um, so some of the means as to, as to hiring locally, you know, he, you know, he's giving you the uh, information that, that he has available to him, that he would encourage that as the owner. Um, but I think we, we need to get into the developing a little bit more as far as who the uh, construction management will be. But from an owner's perspective and from an architect's perspective, we will do everything we can to, to hire locally during the construction. And the estimate of about uh, 60 uh, people being used uh, during the construction um, is probably even a, a low number uh, that I would estimate for a building this size. Got it. Thank you. So we look forward to the submission uh, from you guys uh, as the days to come. All right. With that, thank you. I want to turn it over to Council Member Eugene for uh, his questions. Council Member. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, uh, let me say that uh, this uh, project is a very important project. And I think that uh, the opinion has been uh, very uh, diverse and divided, as I said. But uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, affordability, one of the problems in New York City, people always are complaining about they are affordable, but they are not affordable to everyone. Of course, so there is no way we can make it affordable to everyone. But what I, what I, my question would be uh, to Tony or to, uh, to the representative, uh, knowing that uh, people are complaining some of the time or most of the time, you know, about the affordability of the apartments. Is there any way you, you, you're going to try to include more people? That means to give deeper affordability for those who are working every single day also. And uh, those who are uh, serving the community, but they don't have a high income. They have a very low income. Are you planning to do some effort to include also, those workers, hardworking people who don't have a high salary to be part of this uh, uh, housing, uh, affordable housing opportunity. Hello. So I'll start and, and I think Tony would answer. So um, thank you, Council Member uh, Eugene. Um, so right now the affordability and, and the option that was requested uh, at the community board and at the Brooklyn Borough President was option one, 25% of the, of the units being affordable. And so um, the comments at the Brooklyn Borough President and at the community board were, uh, were two. The first was that they wanted to a reduction in the number of units if possible and an enlarging of the size of the units that were available both for the affordable and for the market rate units. And, the, and, and Tony was happy to do that. We originally came in with a project upwards of between 85 and 87 units. It's been reduced to 80 units. Um, the percentage affordable of those units is currently this option one at 25%. Uh, obviously 10% of the units would be at 40% um, AMI, which is considered to be uh, low affordability. So we're happy to be able to provide that. With regards to anything beyond that, I think there's a couple of things to note. The first thing is that um, we've engaged Foresight Group, which is uh, a renowned expert with regards to affordable issues. And they're currently modeling out the building, looking at the finances to see um, you know, whether or not any deeper affordability can be provided. So Tony's made a commitment to provide what he's able to provide with regards to this project. The issue going forward is that the affordable uh, supermarket here, which you know, there's no, there's no way, other way around it, this is an, a, a supermarket which 
allows for local people to buy affordable uh, produce, dairy, bread, meat, et cetera, that acts as somewhat of a drain on the finances of the building. So um, one of the issues that Forsyth has had with regards to modeling this out is that if you had an entirely residential building or the commercial on the ground floor was not a supermarket, it would be easier to uh, expand the number of affordable units here. Right now, the margins with regards to adding affordable units and keeping the supermarket is very challenging. So we're working on it. It's something that we hope to work towards uh, in the next several days. Um, but, but for now, I think that the, um, you know, we're committed to what's required, but also obviously in an area where you don't get a lot of affordable units at all, we're, we're making a start. So again, we're trying to do the best we can. Um, we're happy that the affordable units will mirror the market rate units generally in terms of the larger units of ones and twos. Um, but, but, you know, that's where we are in the numbers. And thank you very much. Uh, with respect to the uh, uh, food market, uh, this is uh, based on what people are saying. It seems that this is a common ground. Everybody in the community, they see the need uh, to preserve and to protect the food market. And uh, I see that uh, you, you have the commitment to keep the food market, because especially for the senior citizen. And also because of the... Uh, the, the price, the affordability of the good that you are selling there. And that with respect to the uh, local jobs and also business opportunities, let me tell you, this is something that I'm very, very, very uh, 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 concerned about. We're not concerned about it, but I would like to see an all development in my district. And as a matter of fact, I like in the Lost New Theater and Kemba Garden, any uh, project in my district, I always, always, you know, urge the 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 the, 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 the owners to create job opportunities locally. Because as I mentioned before, there are many people in the community. They are they have skill, they are hardworking people, but there's a need of jobs in my community, in the community, and then uh, you know, creating jobs is something very very important in and a development like this one. And also the opportunity for those people who have construction businesses to have a subcontract or the opportunity to have some businesses. Also, this is very, very important for a community like mine. And uh, I know also some of the people that have been talking about opportunities for youth. And uh, especially, you know that the tat lot a small park at the corner of Cotterly Road, they mentioned the desire to see a certain connection from uh, Tony or from uh, with the community board and other to continue to, 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 to maintain uh, the, the tax lot, the small park that, uh, that is used by so many uh, uh, families and children in the community. Can you give us some ideas of your plan to collaborate with community board to maintain the tap lot and also some opportunities that you may create for youth. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Council Member Eugene, for, for the comment and for um, your continuing commitment with regards to employment in the area. Uh, with regards to the two points that you've made, number one, one of the reasons that we do love this application and love Tony as an applicant is because while there may be applicants and developers uh, who, who clean up an application and clean up a property for, for this purpose, for going through ULERP, Tony has a, an operating history here and has continuously employed um, people from the surrounding community, upwards of 30 people from the surrounding community and shown a commitment. So with regards to his maintaining that commitment to allowing for local hiring, and also, I mean, even in things as small as the local laundromat, when he heard that there were issues with regards to the local laundromat and the opportunity for community users to be able to continue using it uh, as a low cost um, a laundromat, Tony spoke with the laundromat owner and committed to uh, relocating that owner, making sure that he was able to operate during the pendency of construction. And we submitted that letter uh, to the city planning commission. So yes, Tony is committed to local hiring. This is something which would continue is happy to make that commitment. With regards to the tot lot, um, the community board expressed, as we did the Brooklyn Borough President, at hearings that this is a, a local concern. And Tony, in the interest of being a good neighbor and the fact that 
in addition to getting something, he's happy to give something. So has ex expressed his commitment to funding the uh, Lieutenant Navarez uh, tot lot on a going forward basis. Uh, as he is fond, as Tony is fond of telling me, he'll be, you know, once this is an actual project, he gets funding, he gets financing, he's happy to do all of this. But particularly with regards to the tot lot, the, the opportunity to add green space to this area for, for both customers, residents, and everyone is something he'd love to do. So yes to both of those, council member. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you very much for the opportunity to ask questions. Thank you, council member. Um, now I invite uh, any of my colleagues who have any questions. Uh, Arthur, do we have any council members that have questions? I see council member. Council member Ayala has a hand raised for the panel. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I have a couple of questions and, and some concerns. Um, obviously, you know, council members um, have already expressed an interest in the job in the local hiring process. So if you could add to the report, you know, how many jobs exactly, how many will be part-time, how many will be full-time, and are any of these uh, expected to be union? Um, that would be really helpful to us. And then I'm also concerned about the affordability of the units. There are 85 units, only 21 of which would be affordable. Um, we don't have an idea of how affordable those will be. I mean, I'm assuming it's 40 and 80, which is, is fine, but um, you, you referenced several times in your testimony that in this community board, you know, um, too many people are paying well above the 50, you know, 50 percent of their income on rent. And so that concerns me. You added, you also mentioned that you added an additional 14 parking spaces. Have you considered the, the uh, possibility of maybe foregoing some of those parking spaces so that you could accommodate more affordable units? So um, thank you, Council Member Ayala, for the questions. And, and uh, it's good to be questioned by you for the first time at the, at the subcommittee hearing. Um, we will add all the materials that you requested to the report with regards to local hiring, the number of jobs, and et cetera. Um, so I think I'd just address the affordability and I'd also address the parking. You know, it's interesting for me that the, um, the Flatbush rezoning in 2009, the, the, the City Planning Commission noted this in their recent report that despite the fact that they created large areas of R7A zoning with voluntary inclusionary housing, which would allow for a bump up affordable for provision, providing affordable housing, there were zero, no units were created pursuant to that program. So I think that the numbers in this area, it's a challenge for affordable housing. And one of the reasons that we're happy that this project is moving forward, um, we don't wanna give wrong answers and we don't wanna give answers that are, that are gonna be uh, disingenuous. Um, Tony's really committed here with regards to the affordability. He knows that it's an issue uh, with regards to the community board or a president with regards to council member Eugene. So the study that he's looking at right now with regards to Foresight Group is penciling out option one. So it's penciling out the lowest affordability and is penciling out, um, you know, for, including 40%. Obviously option one is gonna average 60% AMI, um, but, but again, to the extent that we're able to expand those units, we're going to. Having said that, Foresight has initially found that the margins on the current project, if we wanna put in a 10,000 square foot food store uh, are, are very small. Uh, what amounts to be less than 2%. So it's hard. Um, and we're, we're going to do the best that we can. And we're going to share all the information with the council and with council member Eugene, but it is something we're working on. We would love to have the opportunity to provide less parking if that was going to translate into additional residential units. Uh, and I mean, Victor Folletti, the project architect can address that. But as far as the push and pull is concerned, one of the issues that came up at the community board was that they actually were in favor of allowing for an overage of parking. Um, you know, the parking is all below grade. We can't put residential down there. Most of the utilities are gonna be uh, below grade um, or on the roof. So I don't think that we really have an opportunity to translate that parking. Normally when we do a, um, projects that are primarily affordable housing, we know that parking is expensive. And so, um, so the opportunity to provide more residential units uh, is we're able to do that if we provide less parking. That's really not the case here. We're gonna be going down anyway, so we're just gonna be providing the parking. So um, again, it's something that we're working on that we're thinking about. Um, I think the important thing for us is that we actually have a development project going forward, one that 
you know, provides what we say it's going to provide. Um, so, so we're working towards that and, and um, we do appreciate the thought and we'll get back to the council with the additional information. I appreciate the honesty. I think that for us, it poses a little bit of a challenge, right? Because um, rezonings are our real, you know, and only um, opportunity to really ensure that, you know, um, we're developing in a, in a way that is smart and makes sense for future generations of New Yorkers. And, you know, um, we're really in the midst of a million pandemics as, you know, in the middle of a global pandemic and housing, it continues to be a, a hurdle that we can't, you know, seem to work our way out of um, creating enough affordable housing units has proven to be really challenging in some boroughs. And that concerns me. Um, 21 units is, you know, it's fine. But when you compare the fact that, you know, 64 of them will be market, then, you know, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really um, add up for me. But I, I understand these projects have to get, you know, they have to pay for themselves, right? Um, and so, you know, I, I, I really hope that some consideration is given to, um, you know, to adding additional uh, units. Um, uh, last question. Um, I also see that 52% or 61% of the, of the units are one bedrooms and 31% two bedrooms. And I see that that's kind of like a growing pattern. So I'm wondering, do we no longer have a market for two and three bedrooms? Because in my district, I need five. So I, I'm not understanding that. Uh, I'd say a couple of things. First of all, you know, one of the one of the issues that we've we've actually you know in addition to the parking that you discussed the bulk of the building is actually something which we've looked at as well. Um, this building is going to be 102 feet uh, tall. Um, the R7A zoning, which exists adjacent to this property, can go up to 95 feet. So we're able to keep this building relatively low. It's only seven feet taller than the R7A, which already exists on a portion of the property. The push and pull of that is that if you are trying to keep a building, which, you know, in the R existing R6A, you can go to 75 feet. In the existing R7A, you can go to 95 feet. To keep it to 102 feet and to keep it within this bulk and to provide additional affordability is a challenge. Were we able to, to rezone to a more robust district, we probably would, you would obviously have the opportunity and more flexibility to provide those additional units. But again, um, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can with what we have in, in an area which doesn't get affordable units really at all. Um, but with regards to the unit breakdown, uh, council member, we have had the opportunity to revisit that. We, um, we reduced the number of uh, studios and increased the number of ones and two bedrooms. So we've gone from seven studios, 52 one bedrooms and 26 two bedrooms. So now we're at, uh, we increased the number of two bedrooms. We reduced the studios from seven to two and we increased the two bedrooms from 26 to 31. So we have had the opportunity to get the unit sizes up uh, a little bit and and um, you know one of the things that that was one of the things that was requested by uh, everyone along the way. Okay. Did you opt not to apply for city subsidy for this project? Yeah, we did. I think that there there's an opportunity either to to go all in and to seek city subsidies or not. Uh, and this was a project where um, given the existing commercial on the ground floor and the fact that you know, we didn't necessarily want to be limited with regards to the availability of the envelope and what we wanted to do with that food store, um, Tony basically decided to do this, you know, with with uh, the the uh, not subsidizing it and to do it out, out of his own pocket, if you will. Yeah, I'm just under, I got it, I got it, but I think that it also it doesn't allow you know you the flexibility of also reconsidering the the affordability. Uh, aspect of this project, which I think is really instrumental. And I, you know, I, I the 90 year old building, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it, it, it needs a lot of upgrading and I, uh, I can appreciate the need for redevelopment, but, um, you know, we have a responsibility to ensure that we are creating, you know, as many units as possible. So thank you. Thank you so much. This is very informative. Thank you. Thank you, council member Ayala. Uh, council, do we have any other council members uh, that have any questions? Here, I see no additional members with hands for this panel. Great, thank you. Uh, there being no further questions, the applicant panel is excused. Uh, council, are there any members of the public uh, who wish to testify uh, on this application? Yes, Chair, there are approximately 20 uh, public witnesses registered to speak. Thank you. For members of the public here to testify, please note again that witnesses will be called in groups of four. 
If you are a member of the public who has signed up to testify on the 1620 Road rezoning proposal, please stand by and listen for your name to be called. And be prepared to speak uh, when the chair says that you may begin. Please also note that once all panelists in your group have completed their testimony, you will be removed from the meeting as a group and the next group of speakers will be introduced. After you have completed your testimony and your group has been removed, you may continue to view the live stream broadcast uh, of this hearing at the council's website. We will now hear from the first panel, which will be Harriet Hines, followed by Harry Bubbins, Eileen McGill, and John Oros. The first speaker will be Harriet Hines. Your time starts now. Just a quick reminder, uh, members of the public, uh, you will be given two minutes to speak. Uh, please do not begin until the Sergeant at Arms has started the clock. Harriet, you may begin whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, it's sad to me to see how we have come to this point. The people of this community have cried out to their elected officials, and our cries have, been, have landed on deaf ears. We have been deliberately denied our voice and forced to silence by not being informed of the details of this project in a timely manner. We are now resorted to having to beg just for a life of normalcy and relief from greed of capitalists. Like Custer's last stand, we have coined today as our community's last chance to save Cortelia. As it is a fact of life that sometimes you win some and sometimes you lose some. Saving Cortelia means to preserve our contextual district an area where we are free from towers, where we can actually see the sky, we can breathe and, and, and be free from noise pollution, and where there are no worries of overcrowding. To save could tell you means that existing structures will remain and remain intact. Homeowners will not face the threat of being priced out as we pay enough into taxes already. We will not be, we will be, excuse me, we will not be forced to see the people that work at the stores that serve us suffer from lack of employment and loss of business. With demolition comes an increase of rodents, so to save could tell you will alleviate the threat of that. The character of our neighborhood will be preserved through the landmarking of buildings that capture periods in time that are recorded and valued in history books. Some have said that people represent character and not buildings. I can say that I agree that the character of people can be shown by what they do not value, architecture, improved quality of life, and human bliss. To put a neighborhood through all of this for the sake I'm of- I'm expired. Hello? To Harry, put a- hey, yeah. If you can wrap it up, uh, I'll give you a couple of extra seconds here. Okay, well, I would say, okay, I would say one, that um, as Brooklyn Knights, we show our love for Brooklyn when we beautify it by cleaning streets and green spaces. We now will have to show our love for our borough in June and November 2021, when we, when we have more than 30 days to vote to save Brooklyn. I'm asking for Councilman Eugene to please vote no for the upzoning of Cortelli Road. And just one other thing, um, Mr. Dola, when you um, consider the hiring process, when you build your supermarket, if you will complete hire- uh, Thank please you, Harriet. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Thank you. The next speaker will be Harry Bubbins, who will be followed by Eileen McGill. I can hear Time me. starts now. Wait, let's, let's just stop the clock real quick. Hi, Harry, before we begin, just want to let you know, like signs are not permitted here. So even though you have that on your screen, uh, we don't allow that during uh, the the hearings. Um, if you can take it off, fine. If not, we'll just keep going. But it's just a reminder for everyone. Thank you. Okay, sure. Thank you. Uh, that that's been keeping. Uh, this remote Euler hearing is undemocratic and potentially a violation of law. You just heard another reason. We oppose this luxury up zoning, which is really for the entire block, and that total impact has not been studied. The landlord is part of a supermarket magnate family with the finances and margins and judgment 
to have reportedly bought a condo in one of Trump's towers and who has paid a lobbyist to push this scheme since 2016. The rendering you saw today with the rooftop party areas was never even shown to the local community until today. They also evaded answering if there are any unionized, unionized jobs there now or in the future. The property does have 36 open violations, five barrels of chemicals, one stop work order, and zero hiring plans. Is that a nice neighbor? Upzonings in the de Blasio era from Gowanus to Flatbush are massive scams that result in out of scale development and vastly increased amounts of luxury housing. Mr. Eugene, reject this scheme and at least have a Brooklyn Zoom background. This block was part of the recent Flatbush rezoning with an overall increase in allowable FAR. Cortelyu Road is a unique eclectic strip of predominantly independent small businesses and it was rezoned to R6A as part of that in-depth planning to protect its economic vitality and scale. To erase all that work to gain approval for a luxury upzoning is wrong. The landlord can build a very sizable 100% affordable housing development as of right, up to 75 feet. 1921 Cortelia Road down the block is 100% affordable. So is Caton Flats. Here, they wanna build 87% larger than allowed to increase the private profits. We need landmarking protections for buildings like the Flatbush Saving Banks. We don't need spot luxury up zonings like this. Thank you. The next speaker will be Eileen McGill, who will be followed by John Oros. Your time starts now. Hi. Hello. Hi. Whenever you Hi. OK, I have some notes. Um, so I'm the president of the Beverly Square East Block Association. We completely buttress up against uh, that, that part of Cortell U Road. Um, um, we are not anti-development, but we are against this development. And we kind of want to make it clear that everyone's acting like Tony is this benevolent person doing such good for the neighborhood. I've shopped at his store for 20 years. Um, I do not know Tony. I know every single other employee his employees are terrified. They have no idea what's going on. They don't know if they're gonna have jobs in the future. Our association has had to organize cleanup days to clean his block because he does not. He does not give to any team, sport, school. He's not even a member of the local merchant, the Cortell U Road Merchant Association, which all of my friends are, and they pay their $300 a year dues, which pays for the garbage cleanup on Cortell U Road, which does not happen. But Tony doesn't contribute to that. So we were formerly, Dittmas Park was formerly the most diverse neighborhood in the country. Families that have, are economically insecure and cannot advocate for themselves, we are here to represent them. Families have been pushed out of this neighborhood for years now. There's serious food insecurity. If this above zone building goes through, Crotelio Road, just like everything else this developer is cherry picking in Brooklyn, will quickly become a high rise corridor. The only affordable grocery the nearby and laundromat, which will be displaced, will be six blocks away. And as far, far as affordable, during the pandemic, a, bo a bottle of Prego was $9 in Tony's store. So please stop saying it's affordable. Everyone I know has had to gather and go to other neighborhoods to shop. Many residents and small businesses are based barely surviving this pandemic and this will further okay. marginalize my neighborhood and all of the families in it. Please do not allow this up zoning. Cortell U Road will quickly become a high rise corridor. Please don't do that to our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. The next and last speaker on this panel will be John Owens. Thank you. Um, yeah. I Oh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm sure you're gonna be hearing from a lot more of my neighbors and community members say, saying a lot of the same things which I'm about to say, which is that there is a really strong um, community opposition to this project. You know, um, we, there, there's a lot of reasons that uh, will, be, will be mentioned, including not adequate affordable housing. But one part that I would just like to implore the city council members to really consider is just the, out of scale scope and how unnecessary this is for the stated goals that the developers and applicants are, are pushing forward. Um, if you, I've read, and I, I think just to prove how engaged the community is, that there's been, we're reading into all the, the different um, 
uh, commission, what, what, the, what the borough president has said, he actually called out in his report that he does not agree that the applicant, that it is necessary for this large upzoning to R7D. So I would just really put it on the, the land use committee to, to really consider this seriously. It is up to 87% taller height um, and not adequate affordable housing to allow it. And for all the other reasons that um, the community has shared, we are opposed to it. And I just would, would like to make a finer note um, as, a, as a community member listening in through this whole Euler process, um, starting with the community board, which we weren't, I wasn't aware of when, when it was in front of the community board, but having the community board join on the record meetings with CPC and say that there was confusion on the community board level when this was pushed through. I just think this needs to be rejected outright and, and have the applicant um, you know, go back and reapply because along the way, we are just picking up more and more community involvement um, about this. And it's really interesting to listen to the other applicants that were on, on board today and hear all the community support that's out there for projects that you guys are voting on. And I don't think that there are gonna be nearly the amount of support from our community. In fact, it'll be the exact opposite, phosphorus opposition to this, um, this, this development that is rooted in greed and not in the community's best interests. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Is that the last of our panel, council? Yes, Chair, that's the last speaker on this panel. Is there any council members that have any questions uh, for this panel? Uh, I see no members with um, raised hands for this panel. Okay, there being no more questions for this panel, the witness panel is uh, now excused. And council, if you can please call up uh, the next panel. Thank you all for your testimony today. The next panel includes Anthony Finkel and Junior Juniors. First speaker will be Anthony Finkel. Your time starts now. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, one second. I just want to get my comments together. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Anthony Finkel. I've been a resident of Ditmas Park for over 30 years, and I operate a small business in this community. Uh, for the last two years, I've also served on the board of directors for the Cortelli Road Merchants Association. So I can tell you firsthand that Mr. Tony has contributed to the association financially and uh, in, uh, physically by doing actual work and participating in our events. Um, I'm voicing my support. Uh, for Mr. Tony and the upzoning of 1620 Cortelli Road, as, as uh, Mr. Tony has owned and operated the key food for almost 30 years and has been an active member in the community. Um, after speaking with him, I feel very confident about the upzoning. Upzoning would uh, add at least 20 new affordable housing units to Cortelli Road, which we desperately need. Approving uh, the upzoning would ensure that 1620 Cortelli will remain in the hands of someone who's already been investing in the community for the past 30 years, rather than giving it to a private developer who could do whatever he chooses. The new apartment units will benefit young families by providing them with an opportunity to move into the area instead of pushing young families away who may not be able to afford to purchase the million dollar Victorian homes in our community. The new apartment building and its inhabitants will increase business activity at the local shops, the restaurants, and the bars in the area. This increased business activity is good for Cortelli Road and for Ditmas Park. Uh, finally, I believe that Mr. Tony has proven that he is receptive to the community's needs and wants. Mr. Tony has demonstrated this by adding 20 additional affordable housing, user, uh, affordable housing units while performing the construction in phases as to keep the, soap, the supermarket open and available to the public throughout the development. Uh, Mr. Tony also did not have to go about construction this way. Okay, thank you. Next and last speaker on this panel will be Junior Juniors. Your time starts now. You may begin when, whenever you're ready. does take a little additional time for telephone uh, witnesses.
Uh, it does seem as though we're having a technical issue with Junior Junior's uh, audio. We will attempt to come back to that speaker uh, in a subsequent panel. Uh, and for now, that will conclude this panel. Okay. Um, are there any council members that have any questions for this panel? No, Chair, I see no members with uh, raised hands for this panel. Okay, there being no more questions uh, for this witness panel, uh, this panel is now excused. Council, can you please call up the next panel? The next panel includes Johanna Neufeld, Haley Neuthals, Gabriel Cosman Alter, and Cassandra Jean Pierre. First speaker will be Johanna Neufeld, followed by Haley Neuthals. Your time starts now. Hello? Hello? Oh, got a little echo there. Sorry, can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Okay, sorry about that. No um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to talk with us about this issue. Um, my name is Johanna. I live um, around the corner from the proposed site. And um, our building does have a prepared statement, which one of my neighbors is going to be reading. But in addition to that statement, I just want to note a couple of things that um, Mr. Lobel said that um, I believe are dishonest and a little misleading. Um, right now, we know that the, um, the current building site already has one violation. Um, they did begin the demolition process, which we can see from our building. Um, and the Department of Buildings did do a stop work order. Um, it has since been removed and I believe they have continued demolition, but um, you know, if people are already um, having issues and saying that um, there's something uh, improper going on, I can only imagine what's gonna happen when the big building begins to actually go up. Um, as to their outreach, um, there are many of us who have been um, asking for more information. Um, you know, we've talked to many members of the community and people really don't know what's going on. It's, it's also really misleading to say that they've been doing community outreach. Um, people in the neighborhood don't want their supermarket to be gone. They don't know where they're gonna shop for two years. Um, so to say that they've been, you know, negotiating with the community is just inaccurate. Um, Lastly, I just also want to say that while it is um, an improvement to decrease the number of studios from seven to two, um, that this, this property is not here for low-income community members. It is here to make money for Mr. Tony. Um, I believe that that is what all of his uh, commercial endeavors are for, um, and that's fine, but it is also misleading to say that this is uh, for the community that's going to benefit most of the people here. You know, if you talk about 10% of the 25% of the, of the building, that's really only two or three apartments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. The next speaker will be Haley Newthals followed by Gabriel Cosman Alter. Your time starts now. Only uh, thank you to the subcommittee in Chamoya and the remaining guests here. Uh, thanks for your time. I'm, my name is Haley Newthals. I'm speaking on my own behalf and on behalf of the local organization Flatbush Workers United, which has been organizing alongside the group uh, Safe Curtailu in opposition to this rezoning. Um, for the reasons that have been stated by my fellow neighbors and community members previously, and in addition to what I'm about to say, I am speaking in opposition to this proposal, uh, both because of its uh, intentional dishonesty and its overall lack of proven benefit for the committee or for the community. Pardon me. Uh, as the legal counsel Richard Lobel noted, this developer has had many, many conversations with uh, politicians like Councilmember Eugene, the local community board, and even the borough president's office. Uh, as my fellow citizens of NERD, however, there has been a stark contrast in the amount of outreach to the community itself, um, which includes at our public school, PS249, over 30 languages spoken. So uh, outreach really does need to be comprehensive in order to have any sort of semblance of uh, being enough to, to say you've got uh, the public's support or input on this. 
Um, so the, the outreach has been a massive issue. Um, we've had a lot of issues trying to have our voices heard in this matter, including uh, technical issues with various meetings and uh, particularly during the COVID crisis, online meetings are, are simply really inaccessible for a large portion of our community members. So this is, I think, as others have stated, this entire process does need to be revisited. Uh, concerns have also, I will now speak to a few more specific issues. Uh, concerns have been brought regarding the staged construction of this building. We've heard repeatedly that there are promises to either keep uh, businesses on this property open or have them be relocated during the construction so that they can continue. Uh, and we know they can't do that with the underground parking. Thank you. Thank you, Haley. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker will be Gabriel Kosman Alter. We'll be followed by Cassandra Jean-Pierre. Your time starts now. Uh, thank you very much, committee members. Speaking on behalf of the board of East 17th Street Corporation, we oppose the project in its current form. This project's massing and plans as shown in the EA EAS are not accurate. Bulkhead is missing dead end corridors at plus 80 feet and the site plan has inaccuracies with regard to distance to 400 East 17th Street. That means window to window distances of 40 feet not complying with ZR 23-711. The massing at the rear will have small lot line windows and added costs for required opening protectives per BB 2015-17. The massing is presented as speculative, so where will non-conforming bulk be relocated to max out the FAR? The proposed zoning R7D has a height limit of 115 feet, so approval of the upzoning could lead to an even higher building than presented without carefully crafted stipulations. Our residents at the rear will lose all views as we would with an AOR development, but with a potential new height and bulkhead, we'll also lose light. Lastly, we are seeking to increase our energy efficiency with a solar panel array. Solar panels or green roof would be required for a roof replacement under BB 2019 -010. The upzoning has the potential to partly overshadow our roof, which creates a major conflict if we are required to add solo. Solar may affect our grade letter and will reducing emissions allowances will we incur fines in the future. Some items we would like to see. It would be preferable if the building used 15 feet for the ground floor retail, which is in line with a residential double switchback stair instead of 20 feet and nine feet, eight inch floor to floor instead of 10 feet for residential floors. Parapets should be glass. The elevator could be MRL instead of traction to reduce the bulkhead, but this only gets us so far. Ideally, we believe the massing should be reduced at least a floor below 75 feet at the Western edge and a series of step terraces created to a peak on the east where the core bulkhead should be moved. If the, if the developer picks up the Eastern lots now or in the future, this would allow a central core, which is more efficient. We believe that a step massing, if articulated well, will allow for a breakdown of the steep street wall more in keeping with the context. Uh, we look forward to seeing a viable proposal and massing that addresses the concerns of residents of 417th Street Co-op and that of the community at large. And that's from our board president, Mr. Timothy Subweeks. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Gabriel, for your testimony. Welcome. The next and last speaker, uh, the next and last speaker on this panel will be Cassandra Jean-Pierre. Your time starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us on this. As a lifelong resident of Dennis Park, I oppose the proposed upzoning of Casalu Road. I am, um, as I said, a lifelong resident. I have never before this meeting seen Mr. Tony at any um, Cortelu event. So again, Councilman Eugene, I'm begging you to please vote no for the 1620 Cortelu Road upzoning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cassandra, for your testimony today. Council, do we have any council members who have any questions um, for the panel? Sure, I see no members with uh, questions for this panel. Thank you. There being no more questions for uh, this panel, the witness panel is now excused. And Council, if you can please call up the next panel. The next panel includes Cecilia Cortez, Stacy Shubb, Blake Morris, and Whitney Payne. The first speaker will be Cecilia Cortez, followed by Stacy Shubb. Your time starts now.
And we'll now hear from Cecilia Cortez, followed by Stacy Shubb. Your time starts now. Thank you. Hello, how are you? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, hi, how are you? Uh, my name is Cecilia Cortez. I am, um, thank you for letting me speak. I'm speaking on my own behalf. I am speaking against this project uh, because this project will be, will create more crowdness into our neighborhood and um, it will cut the lights and the subway also will be much more crowded and there are no, um, the, there, there will be much more, many more people in the neighborhood and there is no protections for, uh, they, they will be one of the tallest building in the neighborhood. We have tried for 30 years to bring landmark to the neighborhood, protecting. We have a very nice neighborhood that it has a, a neighborhood, uh, it has business that are owned by uh, people and people shop every day, they walk in the streets and bringing this uh, big building, the only thing it will be is this place, uh, current people who live there, who can afford it because the, the prices that are going to be, uh, are not affordable for people who are living in the community. And I oppose this building. I don't think that it should be allowed this upzoning. It was already, the upzoning was changed already in, uh, 2009. We don't need um, big buildings. What we need is to use the current uh, buildings that are, we have buildings in the neighborhood that are empty because they cannot be afforded by people in the neighborhood. And we are still planning to bring big buildings. It's time to stop that. Please don't allow this building to uh, be developed. Thank you. Next speaker will be Stacy Shubb, who will be followed by Blake Morris. Your time starts now. Do we have Stacy? We do have Stacy. She is uh, in the meeting. Um, give her, give this just a few more seconds to sort out the audio. Okay. Oh. Okay. Okay. Maybe we come back to Stacy and could we hear from Blake Morris? Your time starts now. Hi, I'm Blake Morris. I am a neighbor of this proposed ULERP application and I oppose this project. Um, there are numerous objections that you've heard and you'll subsequently hear from me. I mean, from others after they speak, after they speak um, from me. But my, I'm talking about the increased residential density at this location, the adjacent subway station at Gratilia Road on the Brighton Line to Q Line service, the Broadway Express within 300 feet, the proposed project is incapable of absorbing any increase in residential density at this location on Quintilia Road or in the immediate 10 block radius of the subway station. The station has extremely narrow platforms, operates at over capacity during rush hour due to the nature of the layout of this station and open cut, there's no mitigation measures that are possible and either reasonable or unreasonable mitigation. It's just not possible at all. And it's also only a sole narrow staircase that accesses each platform. An increase in residential density would lead directly to increased rush hour subway use, will be the proximate cause of a passenger fatality or injury. No increase in residential density is possible at this location. Um, I'm asking that the project 
that that the application be denied in its entirety that the applicants can use their 2009 up zoning increase that um that everyone else on the street had received um, and also we have the problem of consistency there is a drugstore and the Flappish Food Co-op, which is within 500 feet of the project. And if this ULERP is approved, those two, other, those two other properties can make the same application and they will not be able to be denied as a matter of law since they are similarly situated. Thank you for your time. We will next hear from Whitney Payne. Whitney Payne, and then uh, we will hear from Stacey Shub. Your time starts now. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for um, allowing the public to participate in uh, this land use meeting. I um, have been living in Ditmas Park for the last 18 plus years. And um, coming from the real estate uh, side of things, I am a proponent for people to be able to renovate and build and develop. However, um, I'm also a proponent for um, neighborhood consistency. And throughout the years I've seen, whether it's in Harlem, Brooklyn, or where have you, there has not been consistency when people come to develop. And having this already have been passed, as they said back in 2009, to be um, an R6 zone, they can continue to do their developing in that same um, zone. And it does not have to um, be up zone to R7. So I would like to implore uh, our council member, um, Mr. Eugene, to vote, to vote against this um, upzoning in its current form. As the gentleman spoke from 400 East 17th Street, um, that with changes, the development can move forward. And those changes um, more affect some others than others in this neighborhood. But crowding is going to be an issue and all kinds of other things that my neighbors have already um, spoke about uh, during this entire process. So as and the problem that we did say earlier was that no one was able to get in early to bring these things to bear at the um, community board level. And um, so now that we are here now, let us go back and begin again with the proper um, architectural design that meets um, everyone's needs, the developers needs and the community's needs together. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you. And we will now hear from Stacy Shubb, who will be the last speaker on this panel. Your time Thanks. starts now. Thank you, sorry for the technological uh, problems before. Right. Uh, much of what I wanted to address has already been said, so for the sake of time, I'll just let you know that although I don't live in the area I do visit, uh, I request the application be denied uh, we can't handle additional density here, especially as someone who has used the subways. I can just attest to the fact that the system is woefully inadequate to handle more co commuters. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy, for your testimony. Um, council, do we have any council members that have any questions for the witness panel? No, oh, Chair, I see no members with questions for this panel. Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, this uh, witness panel is now excused. Uh, Council, if you can please call up the next panel. The next panel includes Megan DeMarcus, Joe Sue Pierre, and Rita Joseph. The first speaker on the next panel will be Megan DeMarcus, followed by Joe Sue Pierre. Your time starts now. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me. My name is Megan DeMarcus. I'm the parent coordinator at PS 139 which is the school that's local to this project. I wanna share a quick story. I was just visiting a family at 1610 Cortelu next door. Uh, the entire family has COVID-19 and they needed thermometers, gloves, masks, Lysol wipes. I went to drop that off. Um, I will tell you that the intercom doesn't work, that the door is covered in graffiti, the front door doesn't lock. And when the family came downstairs to open the door to receive the package from me, I could see that the hallway was full of garbage and that the light in the hallway also didn't work. That is adjacent to two buildings that are uh, two businesses that are have been closed and renovating for, I don't know, years. So I think that the um, developers comment about this being a clean street with no violations 
isn't true. I also bring up this story um, to illustrate who lives in our community. The family that I was delivering supplies to, they are not uh, a family who would be eligible for affordable housing. They're a family that is in need of low-income housing, and that is true of most of the families within our community. Uh, PS 139 is a Title I school. 70% of the families are at or below the poverty line. If this project is to serve our community, it must have low income housing units. This is something we've illustrated to Councilman Eugene and he agrees he knows the community well. I expect that he will vote no to this proposal and will stand with the community in asking that the owner and the developers and the financers go back to the drawing board to develop a project that would serve this community. We are in need of green space and we are sorely in need of a youth or community development center to um, assist families within our community. So uh, yes, there are Victorian houses in this community. Um, I've been here for 15 years. My family has been here for over 40 years and can tell you firsthand that this is a neighborhood families. I will also say that in this process, this is probably my 12th meeting on this particular topic. I started going to these meetings four years ago before the community board and everyone has spoken in opposition to this project except for Mr. Finkel, who I think was on today. So this is definitely a project that has zero community support. We know what our Thank community- Thank you, Megan. Thank you so much for your testimony today. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The next speaker on this panel will be Josu Pierre, who will be followed by Rita Joseph. Your time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Josu Pierre. You can call me Josh. I'm a Flatbush resident and affordable housing activist, a former financial analyst at the New York City Comptroller's Office, where my job was investing pension money into affordable housing, where we use a number of subsidies to achieve that. I'm here today in opposition to the currently proposed upzoning of the entire block facing Cortelli Road between East 16th and East 17th Street. Um, I second many of the statements that were made in opposition before me, and I ask that the plan be voted down and taken back to the drawing board so that we could have a more equitable plan going forward. The focus of any development project seeking upzoning, especially in a district where affordable housing is a major issue, should be prioritizing increasing the number of affordable units throughout. And you have to do that through a robust engagement process that puts community members at the center and not after the fact. This is absolutely not an affordable housing project. This is a luxury project with some sprinkling of affordable housing. 10% of the units would be for 40% of a, at 40% of AMI. That's basically all we're really getting for all of what is being asked of us in terms of the rezoning and the changes being made to the community. The number of affordable units simply do not justify the number of incoming luxury units, which would lead to a domino effect of having more and more of these style buildings come in and completely exacerbate the displacement and gentrification situation that we already see in the Flatbush Dittmas Park area. Um, I heard it was mentioned earlier that the owners are not pursuing subsidies. Having worked with those types of subsidies to create affordable housing across the city already, I can tell you anyone who's not really looking at that is indicating that they, their priority has not been affordable housing. And so to have this being presented as some type of affordable housing project that benefits our community is absolutely a farce. Now I talked about the domino effect. Anytime you've seen a project like this come forth in a community, you can look at Franklin Avenue and Crown Heights, you can look uh, at it has had the effect of increasing these types of developments. So I urge the council, the subcommittee, Matthew, Jean, our council member, and our community members be heard and that we do not move forward with this project and we instead get a vote no and also have it um, redrawn. Thank you. Back. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Thank you. Next and last speaker on this panel will be Rita Joseph. Your time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon. As a member of this community for more than 20 years, I feel deeply that an obligation to oppose this proposed upzoning of 1620. The current proposal is an arbitrary to rezoning that is a plot of land that was previously upzoned as part of the larger 2009. 2009 um, Flatbush rezoning. That rezoning has a significant amount of community input. This proposed rezoning does not. Additionally, this proposal does not provide the affordable housing unit that our neighborhood needs. Our neighborhood in central Brooklyn are already at risk of being gentrified. 
I fear that the proposed project being completed would only accelerate the affordability crisis in our neighborhood. We are already facing a shortage of affordable housing supplies throughout Brooklyn as a proposed currently. This project would not help matters. Lastly and significantly, the proposal will take away the only laundromat in the neighborhood which services the entire community. I urge the council subcommittee to oppose this upcoming upzoning. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Rita. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. Council, um, do we have any council members that have any questions for this panel? Chair, I see no members with questions for this panel. Okay, there being no more questions uh, for this panel, this witness panel is now excused. And council, can you call up uh, the next panel, please? The next panel uh, will include Robert Elstein. Robert Elstein. Your time. Oh, hello, I'm here. Present. Um, may I speak? Yes. Okay. Sorry, Thank you. Ready, Robert. Um, okay. Robert? Did we lose Robert? I don't believe that we've lost him. I see him in the meeting. Uh, okay, I think he's coming in. Robert Elstein will be the next speaker. Uh, Robert, can you hear us? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Sorry, just yeah, plugging in. Sure. Whenever you're ready. Um, and now, uh, okay, I'm ready. Okay. Okay, I, I was just walking around outside. Um, I was just on the block of 1620 Cortelio, and um, it's really such an inappropriate proposal. The character of this neighborhood is one that retains that of old New York. Um, it's a really enjoyable, wonderful place to walk around. It's a wonderful place to go shopping, to go to a cafe, to eat in a restaurant. Um, I, I've, I've lived in this neighborhood for 42 years and it's maintained the character that it's had since it was first developed in the early 20th century. Um, from a preservation standpoint, this proposal is absolutely ludicrous. From an environmental standpoint, um, it's murderous. Um, the way that ULERP is designed to have absolutely no um, consideration for the environmental impact is, uh, in my mind, really unethical and immoral. Um, I will also say that. Um, there needs to be a change to ULERP in terms of the AMI. Um, it is, the, the intent of ULERP was to create affordable housing for uh, families. All that's happened as a result of ULERP is one bedroom and studio apartments at or above market rate because of the way that it's tied to AMI. Until ULERP is reformed, um, we need to seriously consider whether we can go forward with any of these developments. And that's the end of my testimony and I thank you all for your time. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for your testimony today. We have an additional speaker, uh, an additional witness for this panel. Uh, the next speaker on this panel will be Avi Glickstein. Avi Glickstein. Your time starts now. Hey, Avi, you have to unmute yourself. Hold on. Hi, I'm sorry. I thought I was registering to be in the meeting and not actually speak, but I do oppose the project and I support, um, I'm a parent at PS 139. Um, and I know, I'll say what I said at the, at the meeting where they were uh, at the prior meeting, which is that um, this is a community, we, there are 30 languages spoken at our school. Um, it's a Title I school, as Megan said, our parent coordinator. Um, and there's extreme um, food insecurity in the neighborhood. There is a, 
a food pantry on Coney Island Avenue and um, Foster Avenue a little further down, uh, which was profiled uh, in the New York Times Daily um, podcast because it has a thousand people every week coming, lining up because of the pandemic. Um, there's another group called People in Need that serves people. It's just, this is not a neighborhood that needs upzoning or luxury apartments. There's a, a building at one end of Cortelli Road that was renovated from um, a former site that laid dormant for a long time that is now a, is empty. Um, there's one at the other end um, that was just developed, um, which seems to also be uh, empty or um, continues to be empty. So uh, we don't need more one bedroom apartments. The, the fact that this is a majority one bedroom apartment development, um, let alone going above the, the zoning level. Um, I'm not opposed as many other people are to development. It's just, this is not, as Megan said, we need low income housing and we don't need to push the limit so that other developers can come in here and create a canyon. I come from, <laughs> I grew up in Miami Beach where we had something called Condo Canyon uh, down one of our street down Collins Avenue. And I don't want Cortelli Road to become that where there's no sunlight and there's no um, air flow because it's surrounded by tall towers. I mean, um, it's ridiculous, but thank you very much. Um, and council member Eugene, um, please vote against this. Um, I know you've given some money to, uh, to the school. Um, this would be even more impactful for the community than any money you could give to the community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Avi. Chair, the next speaker uh, in the hearing is Junior Junior. Junior Junior. Your time starts now. I know we had some issues with Junior Junior uh, access earlier. I'm gonna see if we can get them in here a few more seconds. While, while we wait for, for Junior uh, to come on, I just wanna uh, give everyone a reminder as well that if you would like to submit your written testimony, you may email it to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Okay, it appears that we have lost Junior Junior. Uh, so that is a, a timely reminder. And uh, that concludes this panel chair. And at this time, uh, if I may, we'll do a last call for any outstanding public witnesses. Okay. If there are any members of the public who wish to testify on the 1620 Cortelli Road rezoning proposal, please press the raise hand button now. The meeting will now briefly stand at ease uh, while we check and confirm uh, for members of the public. Chair, we're gonna try. Uh, we're gonna try again uh, with Junior. Junior, it appears that um, they've been able to rejoin. Uh, so, if we can get testimony from Junior. Junior, at this time. Okay, uh, apologies for that. We do have another public speaker. Uh, I'm gonna ask that the unidentified phone caller 
uh, with a number ending 6182 be uh, permitted to testify. The, we have a phone in caller with a number ending 6182. Your time. Hi, this is Ilana. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, Thank wonderful. You. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm Ilana. I'm a local resident and small business owner. I'm here to say that we do not need to choose between being pro-growth and pro-community. However, in this case, this project is pro-growth and anti-community. I am from Save Cortelu, a group that has been advocating for community-first and consensus-based thoughtful development based on the outcome of our community board meeting and the hundreds of people that we enjoy talking to on the street that were against this. This group and I and, and many others who spoke are part of a coalition of 250 working parents, social workers, teachers, senior citizens, college students, urban planners, and small business owners. We started two months ago having teach-ins, Zoom parties on telling people what AMI, MIH, and FAR is. We have full-time jobs and we have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Richard Lobel and his team. We have the people and they have the power. And I appreciate you listening to us. I'll touch on one point uh, specifically on food access and jobs. I'd like to underscore that the supermarket was one of the major reasons for the neighborhood coalescing around support and why our community board voted for it. However, to be a good neighbor, you must take care of your people and you must tell the truth. Tony is not a good neighbor. We have no plan for what will happen to the employees, 100 plus employees that will be out of a job that work at the laundromat and the grocery store. For 18 months to two years, during the excavation of 44 parking spaces. To repeat, the supermarket will not be open, and this is one of the reasons why the community supported it. I implore you, based on your discussion, to please, please make any community benefit binding and to understand that the developer has not acted in good faith since the beginning. I'm here to ask you to reject this upzoning to R7D and ask for a better project to come forth and for the um, developer to talk to us and to restart again without restarting the cycle, um, the Europe, the Europe cycle. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Council, do we have any other members of the public? Uh, Chair, it does appear that we may have one additional uh, speaker to testify is individual identified as Baruch Wiseman uh, here and wishing to testify, Baruch Wiseman. Your time starts now. Can you hear me? Hi, good afternoon. I appreciate your allowing me to give a quick uh, comment. Uh, the area is already densely overpopulated relative to the rest of the community board district 14. And most of the concentration of high rise apartment buildings are along the corridor of Ocean Avenue and the Northwest corner. And there's already been a tremendous strain on the public infrastructure by allowing excess development rather than di distributing the uh, developers throughout the remainder of the district. We're overloading already the crumbling infrastructure. The walls of the subway station are crumbling. The platforms are narrow. The public schools are overcrowded over their allotted um, density. So these are just a couple of examples of poor community board planning because the remainder, the three fifths of the district of community board 14 are comprised of low rise housing, one and two single or two family homes. And most of the new development has been concentrated in this corner of Dittness Park. So I think that we should adopt a different attitude as in Minneapolis, where they actually 
created public housing in low rise density portions of the districts in the various neighborhoods and then turned into a tremendous success in allowing de facto integration rather than de facto segregation, which is still being maintained by this policy of this community board and throughout the remainder of the community boards in New York City. Thank you for allowing me to share my comment. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, we appreciate it very much. Council, do we have any other members of the public that wish to testify? Sure, Moya. With that, uh, I see no additional members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Great. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, there being no uh, members of the public who wish to testify on the 620 Cartel U Road uh, rezoning proposal under ULERP numbers C180496 CMK and N180497 ZRK. The public hearing is now closed and the item is laid over. That concludes today's business. I would like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, uh, the subcommittee council, land use and other council staff and the Sergeant at Arms for participating in today's meeting. Thank you. Uh, this meeting